Hey guys. This is part 6 of what if Naruto was adopted by the Umbu. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 12, He's Who? Ten years old. Sasuke and Sakura waited in the designated training ground the next morning, each growing increasingly more and more impatient. Finally, a good hour after they were supposed to meet, a chattering voice caught their attention. Now, now, we're not that late, said a voice Sasuke identified as their new teachers. It had taken tracking down Iroka sensei and demanding answers to even get the man's name. Unfortunately, Iroka sensei had seemed to think that the Uchiha had forgotten and was embarrassed. So all he'd come away with was the reminder that the man's first name was Kakashi. He had told Sakura though, when she'd asked. Because it would be annoying for her to ask again. It's your fault, sensei, Naruto's voice retorted, biting the last word into its two syllables and spitting them out with an angry frustration that the Uchiha didn't know the easygoing kid was capable of. I'm holding you fully culpable if they eat me. They are both old enough to restrain themselves. Kakashi-sensei's tone was suggestive. Naruto began to shout as they came into view. What, and I'm not? I'm only two years younger. You're mean. That does it, you're in my black book. I thought I already was in your black book? Kakashi-sensei remarked as they came to a halt in the training ground. You're further into my black book. You just made it above ebisa sensei Kakashi winced. Hello, team, he said brightly, finally turning his attention to the two eldest students. You're late, sensei, Sakura accused. Kakashi smiled sheepishly. The emotion was actually masked glee, but Naruto was the only one who would know that. Am I? Oh, dear. Well, you see, there was a little lost puppy in my kitchen this morning, and so I had to help it, and then on the way here, Naruto. Can we just get on with this? Naruto cut in. He seemed to be in an ill humor, and the father had a certain suspicion that his child was anxious about potential teasing that could result from the squad assignment. Kakashi decided he'd tortured his brat enough for the moment, and chose to comply. Okay, he said happily, and proceeded to explain the particulars of his brand of the bell test. Naruto, he noticed dimly, was actually listening, a dull, bored expression on his face. It was almost comical when put between the two dead serious expressions of his teammates. You have until noon to get the bells, he cautioned. Ready? Go. The genin scattered, Naruto's mind working frantically. He'd be damned if he let his father flunk him on this test, but in order to pass, he would somehow have to work with his teammates, prove that they had potential as a unit. First things first, he should find them. Sakura was easy to locate crouching under a bush not far away. Naruto crawled towards her on his belly and jerked her ankle, making her squeak and whirl around. Naruto winced. His dad would have heard that. Sakura's green eyes were wide with surprise. Naruto! What dash? She began, but Naruto cut her off with a slashing motion with his hand. Using the simplest of hand signals which even civilians would have been able to interpret, he told her to follow him and began to crawl away holding his breath and praying her curiosity and his confidence would combine and convince her to follow him. After a moment, the bushes began to rustle behind him as Sakura followed him carefully. Naruto led her towards the tree whose canopy he knew Sasuke was concealed in, choosing a route that the girl behind him could take, mindful of the fact that she was older and accordingly bigger than he was, even though he himself was big for his age. Even with his care to take a roomier path than he would have normally, he could hear her occasionally squeak or yelp as her hair and clothes caught on the branches around her. Naruto rolled his eyes. Civilian-born females. Always putting fashion first. Finally, they reached Sasuke's tree and Naruto gathered his feet under him, meeting Sakura's questioning eyes and making a follow-me motion, before jumping straight up, landing on one of the lower branches of the tree. Soon, he and Sakura had climbed to meet Sasuke who had torn his eyes off Kakashi and was glaring at the pair as if trying to make them spontaneously combust. What the hell are you doing? He hissed. Sakura shrugged helplessly. 
Naruto just said to follow him, she whispered quickly. I didn't know he was bringing me here. I'm sorry, Sasuke-kun. Naruto cut her off. We need to work together, he said without preamble. At the twin incredulous and angry looks he received, he elaborated, that's the real reason for this test. It has nothing to do with each of us competing for the bells. It's all about how well we can work together as a team. Look, at the moment, we suck. Right now, he's just interested in measuring our potential not to suck. Sasuke snorted. It was bad enough that he was being forced to work with a kid without that kid making stuff up to try and seem smart. Time to take him down a peg before he got worse. Che. If that's the case, then why can only two people pass this round? He asked reasonably, if caustically. Don't bother with him, Sasuke, scoffed Sakura, turning away. He doesn't know anything. He's just a little kid. Naruto closed his eyes in disbelief. Did these two really believe he had grown up in a Jounin's house without picking up a few tips? This is ridiculous, he thought. He moved forward and stomped on a set of uncovered toes. Sakura, who owned the toes, squealed in pain and jerked away. Naruto stepped closer again, entering her bubble and raising one finger. First point, I, unlike you, have been through these before. I have watched at least a half dozen teams failed, and so I've picked up a few things not to do. He raised a second finger. Second point, my father has been grooming me for this literally since I could walk. If this were a real situation and not a test, our best bet would be to team up in the hopes of getting the bells from our most dangerous enemy and then if we needed to killing our weakest member so each surviving member got a bell. This isn't a real fight, you stupid Sasuke began acidly, but Naruto plowed through, as if he hadn't heard. Third point, haven't you even noticed that there are only ever teams of three genin, not two or less? That's because the default squad is four members, our fourth being our Jounin instructor. So, we all pass or we all fail. Fourth point, he turned and glared at Sakura. I am not some little kid. I am just as skilled as you are, and I'm not gonna let the fact that you're a girl stop me from proving it, with violence if I have to. Fifth point, he paused for effect, looking between the two silent twelve-year-olds, one sullen, the other shocked, I kinda know this Jounin very well, and I have a plan. I am not flunking this test. So are you going to work with me or not? Kakashi watched a bird fly overhead, swooping happily and wondered how long this would take. Sure, Naruto knew the true purpose behind this test, but convincing the other two was another matter entirely. Idly, he wondered if it was ethically sound to give his kid a passing mark in this test. Maybe he should have changed it to something Narapup hadn't seen before. Well, he wasn't really expecting the kids to pass this time through, anyway. Maybe he'd send the two older ones back to the academy, and take Naruto as an apprentice or take Sasuke as an apprentice, and let Naruto stew in the safety of the academy for a couple of years. Last week, Kakashi had been happy for his kid to graduate. Now, he was having doubts, and was seriously considering taking his permission back again. Saratobi would be irritated, but... A muffled cry from among the trees made him glance up from his novel for a second, but he quickly dismissed it. Silly, clumsy Jenin, he thought derisively. If I were a real enemy, I'd be able to locate and eliminate each of them easily just from the goddamned racket they're making. Briefly, he considered going and teaching the brats a lesson, but shrugged it off. Nah. They're rookies. I'll cut em some slack. Besides, knowing Naruto, this could well be bait to draw me into a trap, whereas if I stay right here, I choose the battleground and they have to come to me. Decision made, he turned back into his novel only to look up sharply as the harsh tang of blood made its way to his nose. Who was bleeding? Why? Concern built as Naruto stumbled out of the tree line, gripping his left arm as if in pain and lips trembling. Dad, he cried, his voice wobbling. Kakashi the father was very worried, but Kakashi the shinobi steadied him, making him approach slowly and cautiously. This could be a trick. Naruto, he said in a careful reply. Naruto looked up, and Kakashi's heart lurched when he saw real pain on his son's face, before the tears welling in those blue eyes overflowed and began streaming down the boy's cheeks. Dad, he choked, taking a few more stumbling steps towards his father, almost desperately. 
Daddy? That was enough to convince Kakashi. Naruto really was hurt. But how? And by whom? Naruto? What happened? He demanded, striding closer. When he was within ten meters, he could see that the child had a long gash down his left forearm, wrapped clumsily in a bandage. As Sasuke, Naruto stuttered brokenly. H. He attacked M.E.W.H. when I.T. told him we S.H. should work together. Kakashi felt a jolt of fury towards the dark Uchiha, but he put it aside for the moment, intent on aiding his son. It's okay, Naruto, he soothed, closing the distance between them as Naruto collapsed to sit on the ground, sobbing. It's going to be all right. No, it's not, Naruto sobbed back. Kakashi was a bit taken aback. His son hadn't acted like this for at least three, maybe four years. Then again, there was a lot riding on this test, and he supposed being snubbed and then injured by a classmate, and now teammate would have to smart something awful. In the back of his mind, he felt guilty for more or less deciding to flunk the chibi. It'll be okay, sure, sure, Kakashi soothed, crouching to place a hand on each of Naruto's shoulders. Naruto's blue eyes flicked to his face, then passed his shoulder before returning to the ground. Then, he sniffed, and used his good hand to brush away some of the fast-falling tears. Kakashi's attention was caught by the eye's movement, and he began to turn, checking what Naruto had been looking at. He knew that both Sasuke and Sakura were in that direction, and... Daddy up! Naruto suddenly demanded, every bit as juvenile as the last time he had said that, at six, four years ago. Kakashi stared at him his undivided attention effortlessly grabbed. Naruto would never let himself sound so babbish. You're not Naruto, he said flatly. Quite unexpectedly, Naruto's morose expression totally disappeared and his tears dried up. Crocodile tears, Kakashi realized with a jolt. His face broke into an impish grin. I am actually. At that exact moment, Kakashi was attacked from three separate sides at once and he was forced to shove Naruto to the ground onto his injured, and it was really injured, arm in order to stand and protect his bells from Sakura's grab. Elbowing her, he got no small amount of satisfaction from driving the heel of his palm into Sasuke's nose, perhaps harder than he should have, but he knew that the bit about Sasuke wounding him in Naruto's story had been true. It just seemed his son had figured out a way to adapt and use his injury. Feeling an odd stab of a mixture of pride and nostalgia, Kakashi drove the trio into a group and retreated away, so that they were facing each other warily. What a manipulative little bugger I've raised. Top performance, Naruto. I commend you, he said lightly. You really had me fooled there. But it's not enough to get these bells. Naruto half shrugged, tucking his injured arm into his jacket to keep it protected and stationary. Sasuke had a hand to his nose and blood streaking down his chin, while Sakura was rubbing her ribs. Okay, plan B, the blonde said softly, and the trio instantly fell into a careful, if unpracticed, formation, moving to circle their teacher. Naruto took point, falling into a long-practiced battle stance, kanai in hand. Kakashi grinned fondly at him for a moment, taking in his earnest face and mentally musing that the youth really wanted to pass this, enough to deceive his father something that was a big no-no in the Hataki household. Ah, uh, I love that cute little smirk you have when you're about to stab me, he said lightly as Naruto attacked him, grabbing his wrist and pushing it aside gently before sweeping the boy's legs out from underneath him, spinning to fend off a joint attack from Sakura and Sasuke. A little repetitive, children, he scolded. Now run along. You're never going to get these bells like this. Why are you all trying this? Each time one of you attacks, it makes the others even more obvious. Ganging up is harmful to your cause. Especially as there are only two bells, and three of you. Yes, we can count. Naruto shouted, stumbling to his feet. He was annoyed, Kakashi perceived, and his arm was hurting him. Stop lecturing. Sakura made a noise of fear at the rudeness, but Kakashi was only amused. In short order, he attacked and drove the genin away, sending them bolting for the cover of the trees, before falling back and standing comfortably in the center of the clearing, using a thumb to flick open his book again. In the trees, the genin regrouped. Okay, that didn't work, Naruto spat. He glanced up at the older boy. You okay? 
He got you pretty good, huh? H.N. Sasuke forced himself to pull his hand away from his, probably broken, nose and shrugged. Whatever. Doesn't hurt. Liar, Naruto scoffed, shifting. Ow. That gash you gave me really hurts, bastard. Naruto, don't call Sasuke-kun that. Sakura scolded. Then she deflated. What do we do now? She looked at Sasuke, obviously asking him for direction. We don't give up, Naruto cut in. There are other things we can try. Next we should. Two hours and several attempts later, they still hadn't gotten the bells when the alarm went off at noon. Sasuke's nose had stopped bleeding, but now he had an interesting bruise along his cheek, and Naruto had bumps and grazes all over him. Sakura was bound to a post in the center of the clearing, as Kakashi had decreed since you are the only one uninjured, you must not be pulling your weight, so you can go without lunch. Naruto groaned and collapsed backwards on the grass, his hurt arm throbbing. Kakashi closed his, now slightly singed, book with a snap. Okay, he smiled, since you three all failed to get the bells, you all fail. Naruto sat up. Ah, come on, he whined. You know and I know that this test is all about teamwork, and had nothing to do with the bloody bells. Language, Kakashi said mildly, and figuring out the real test is half the test itself. You told them, so the fact that you worked as a group is a moot point. Naruto jumped up, facing down his father, very ready to have out this verbal spar. But it would have been an act of sabotage and horrible teamwork to conceal the information from my squad, he argued. And besides, you warned me not to tell them. Kakashi raised an eyebrow. By your own admission, you did anyway. Naruto waved away the point. That's just disobedience, he informed the man. Kakashi shook his head. My decision is final. But he paused, guilt warring with his almost subconscious decision to make this an unwinnable task, seeing as you started with a handicap, I'll give you one last chance. After lunch, you'll have half an hour to try and get the bells from me. Boys, your lunches are there. He pointed a gloved hand at the neatly stacked boxes. Sakura is not to be fed. I'll find you for the start of our next test. Ja any. He vanished, and Naruto sighed, sinking onto the ground, muttering mutinously. Stupid hypocritical, just doesn't want to admit someone can pass his test, stupid. Here, Sakura, are you hungry? Sakura squeaked yet again as she saw Naruto holding out his box of bento to her, having shoved the other one at Sasuke. And no. Sensei said that you see couldn't feed me. She stuttered. Don't make any more trouble. Naruto sighed and shrugged, lifting his chopsticks. If you change your mind, let me know, he said lightly, before he began to eat. Sasuke picked at the rice, his forehead creased in a frown as he thought. Naruto, he said abruptly, making Naruto glance up. That first plan you had, the one where you used that wound I gave you to get Sensei's attention, you were calling for daddy. Naruto nodded suspiciously. Yeah. So what? he asked defensively. Sasuke's dark eyes bored into his blue ones. How did you know that would distract him? he asked. The suspicion slid off Naruto's face as he shrugged. Always has, he scowled, still angry at their failure. He'd be damned if he let his dad flunk him, but Kakashi was obviously going hard on them, probably so as to avoid later claims of nepotism. What do you mean, always has? Sasuke demanded. How did this brat know how their teacher? As unorthodox as he was, Kakashi was obviously a seasoned jonin. Even Sasuke, with all his connections, knew precious few of the elite of Konoha on a personal level. Suddenly, a disturbance in the direction Kakashi had ambled made the trio of children look around. It sounded like Sensei was arguing with someone. Look, I told you, it's my decision. Leave this alone, or I'll cut you out of the loop entirely. Kakashi was saying angrily. Listen, brat, I know you're doing the best you can for this kid, but sometimes you're going to have to listen to your elders. Sakura caught a glimpse of the newcomer through the trees and gasped. That's Jiraiya-sama, one of the legendary Sanin. We learned about him in school. But why is he here? Naruto hid his face in his hands. Oh, crap, he moaned, Gigi's here. Then he sat up and, in one movement, cut Sakura free. 
he knew his father was too distracted to notice for the time being. Gigi? Sakura repeated faintly, looking at the boy. Well, it would explain some things. Never mind that, Sasuke interrupted. Go back to Kakashi Daddy, he ordered. Naruto groaned and fisted his wild hair. Okay, he said, listen. You're obviously confused, so I'll put this plainly. Kakashi's my dad, Jiraiya's my godfather. I don't know why, dad hates him. There was a stunned pause. Sasuke scowled, his face curling into the well-practiced expression totally unconsciously. The brat's father? Well, that was just great. There was no chance of being trained properly now. No doubt the Jounin would favor his own son above all else. He brushed aside the slightly uncomfortable thought that his attacking the kid earlier right under Kakashi's nose may have some unpleasant repercussions while in the back of his mind, a part of him berated himself for not recognizing the Jounin on sight. Though in all fairness, Sasuke had never been one of Naruto's friends, had never hung out with him after school, and had never paid the slightest bit of attention to who it was who collected him each day beyond a vague awareness that someone did. He didn't know many of his classmates' parents by sight, including Sakura's parents, and he would lay money on the fact that she hadn't known his parents either, before. Naruto frowned at his team. What's the big deal? He asked. I mean, was it so hard to figure out that Hitaki Kakashi could be my father? We were never told his name, Sasuke pointed out icily. We didn't even know his given name until Iruka sensei told me. Naruto blinked. They were right, he realized, and suddenly the stunned mullet expressions made sense. Oh, well, now you know, he said eventually. The argument they were overhearing seemed to be verging on violent, and he winced, standing. Excuse me? He found his family easily enough, facing off against each other, and drew up to the sidelines. I am his father, Kakashi hissed, a challenge Naruto couldn't identify in his voice and face. Jiraiya opened his mouth angrily but cut himself off with an obvious effort. I will decide what will happen to him. He's just a child, Jiraiya. Can you teach him to control his abilities? Jiraiya snapped back. Can you help hone and develop his potential? Are you a seal master who can maintain and teach him to maintain complex seals, as he needs to be able to do? Naruto was confused by this declaration. Why would he need to know seals? Sure. He'd studied the beginnings of seal theory to appease his godfather, on and off, depending on how his father felt about the Sanin on any given day, but he couldn't see a reason he had to really master it. Kakashi was speaking again. Can you give him stability? Friends? Interaction with people his own age? And a feel for life as a ninja in a hidden village? A family who loves him? Jiraiya looked as if he'd been slapped. I do love him. He shouted back. It looked like they were about to degenerate into blows, so Naruto decided to step in. As much as he would enjoy such a fight, he had no wish to see one of these men turned into orange goo. He had a sneaking suspicion it would be Dad. Hey! That's enough! He shouted, taking a few steps forward. Both men turned to him, and he added cheekily, Don't make me put you in time out. You know the rules. One minute for every year of your age. Man, you guys be there forever. Especially you, GG. That diffused the tension quite nicely. You little brat. Jiraiya declared, and Naruto grinned. Kakashi drew his son closer with a flick of his hand and, when Naruto approached, swatted him upside the head. Don't be cheeky, he said. Also, you three pass. Naruto grinned. Thanks, Dad, he said softly, so only Kakashi could hear before raising his voice to whoop and dance backwards, out of reach of both men. Yes. We pass. Tuning tail, he ran to where Sasuke and Sakura were standing, having come to investigate the commotion. Then, the grin slid of his face and he scowled. Ah, man. Passed on a grudge. What just happened? Sakura asked weakly. Naruto grinned up at her, sheepish. Seems Gigi wanted me for an apprentice. And dad's way against that so dad, being dad, passed us just to spite him. He does that. Um, look guys, this is like, a family dispute, and will probably go on for ages. So, since dad is too distracted, I'll tell you, we'll probably meet up tomorrow, yeah? 
Around, say, ten, outside the Hokage Tower? If I'm wrong, I'll alert you tonight, but it's where Dad usually meets his new teams. Um, I'm gonna herd the rentals into a more private setting now, before they start, like an embarrassingly domestic fight, K. See ya. Bye, Sakura said, sounding faint. Sasuke just nodded dumbly as Naruto ran back to the still bickering pair of adults and tugged on their new sensei's shirt insistently. Come on, daddy sensei, he said, half joshing, half whining. I'm hungry and my arm hurts. Can we leave? That distracted both men quite effectively, and the two twelve-year-olds were left forgotten in the training field as Kakashi snatched up his son and the two ninja left at top speed, headed for the hospital with Naruto protesting the ride the whole way. There was a silence after they were gone. Then, just as Sakura was getting up the courage to say something to her crush, Sasuke seemed to shake himself out of his shock. Well, come on then, he grunted, fishing in his pocket for a handkerchief and holding it to his nose to wipe away the blood that had dripped down his chin. Sakura squeaked. W.H. what? She stuttered. Sasuke shot her a dull look. I'm going to ask around town. See if I can find out any more about the Hataki family, especially the blonde baby. Are you coming or what? Sakura nearly had a stroke. Sasuke-kun was actually asking her to come along with him. No, more than that, had assumed she'd be coming, as if, her breath caught, as if he thought she belonged with him, by his side. Oh, her dreams were coming true. S.S. sure. She squeaked, so high-pitched she sounded like a mouse being trodden on. Sasuke turned away and began to walk. Come on, then. The denizens of Konoha were, in accordance with the ninja village, generally quite close-mouthed. However, when it came to gossip. Hataki Naruto? The lady in the weapon shop said, blinking with a bit of a smile. Of course I know him. He and his father are in here every other month. He's such a sweet child. They're in here that often? Sakura asked. How often did that kid lose his kanai? The woman nodded. Ever since he was a little boy on his father's hip. She grinned conspiratorially and leaned forward, whispering, I heard he teed on kanai. Knowing Hitaki-san, I'd believe it, too. It was a similar story everywhere they asked. Everyone seemed to know something about the mischievous blonde. Oh yes, the little one comes in here all by himself sometimes for bread. The woman at the bakery chattered when they stopped to get some bread for Sakura's mother and casually inquired about their third teammate. You know, I've known since he was, oh, a wee little thing. His daddy always buys bread here, see, just like his granddaddy did. Gifted little thing, always chattering and asking questions. You know, I heard he was reading by eighteen months old. The man where they stopped for lunch at the dango shop had something a little more interesting he didn't quite mean to say which intrigued Sasuke. Oh yes, he's a charming man, Hataki, and his child is very cute. Daughter is quite taken with them. Talented too, I've heard. Lives up to the Hataki name nicely. Only, an ugly expression passed over the man's face briefly. I did wonder at his father's choice of name. Sasuke looked up, interested. What do you mean? He asked. Naruto is odd, yeah, but... Sakura added, trying to prompt the man on. The man hesitated, rubbing his hands uncertainly over his large sides. You two would be too young to remember, but once there was a child, about your age, actually, with the same name, nasty piece of work that one, but he died, the man said abruptly. What are you, Dash? Sasuke began suspiciously, but the man cut him off. No, no, don't you two worry your heads about it, he said forcefully. It's dead now anyway. But that Hataki kid, well, I heard he graduated the academy this year, at ten. Can you beat that in these times, eh? As they left the shop, a man wearing a jounin vest and a headband waved them over. Hey, kids. Come here. Cautiously, the new genin approached what looked to be a gathering of three adult ninja. What? Sasuke asked darkly aware that Sakura was hiding behind him. The shinobi grinned. I heard you asking about Hataki Naruto in there. Why the interest in Kakashi's kid, huh? He asked seriously, taking a saban out of his mouth and spinning it in his hand. Sasuke frowned. What's it to you? He asked. 
The brunette Jownin raised an eyebrow. Vetted interest, he said lightly, his brown eyes boring into the dark ones of the Uchiha, fingers flicking the end of the throwing needle as if waiting to use it. You'll find a lot of us are interested in the little one's safety, and we don't like it when other people with no need to be get interested. Sakura squeaked in fear and quailed behind Sasuke, her eyes flashing to the other two shinobi and whimpering. That had been a threat. Relax, Sasuke said, apparently unruffled. We're Kanahan ninja, okay? Naruto was in our class. Now he's on our team. I can vouch for that, Jen, the female ninja said unexpectedly, leering through her purple bangs. That's the Uchiha whelp. I was his invisible guard last time his brother was in the neighborhood. I heard a rumor he'd been placed on the Chibi's squad. Sasuke jolted, not at all prepared for the unpleasant surprise that Itachi had been near Konoha without his knowledge, much less that he had invisible guards when he did so. The aura of doom the genin had managed to build up vanished in a heartbeat, and he was left feeling a little out of kilter. We just wanted to know about him, he said hesitantly. Little Jenin shouldn't be too nosy, the third person said, and this one the children recognized. Asuma-sensei. Yeah, yeah? He placed two cigarettes in his mouth and lit them both, then took one in his hand and offered it to the woman. She grinned and took it. Seriously, kids, watch yourself. Naruto's the son of a much-liked and very powerful jounin with a great many connections. You'll find the kid knows most ninja aged twenty and up by name and most shinobi would flock to protect him, if need be. If you want information, be a little more subtle. Not that he needs it, snorted the woman, taking another drag of her cigarette and wrinkling her nose. These suck, Asuma. What are they? He told her the brand, and she scoffed before continuing. He's been training with live kunai since he was four. He can handle himself. Do you think there's any truth to the rumor that Kakashi takes him on missions? The first man asked, Saban back between his teeth, a grin playing about his lips. The other two grinned back, and Sasuke's eyes widened. No. Freaking. Way. Asuma-sensei, Sakura appealed to her ex-teacher. Kakashi-sensei doesn't take Naruto on missions, does he? That's so dangerous. The Sarutobi hesitated for a long moment, staring at her as if debating what to say. Not all rumors are truth. Asuma-sensei said sternly. But most have at least an element of truth to them. Remember that. The other man, the one with the Samban, nodded his agreement. Yes. Also, you might want to be careful. Naruto was kidnapped when he was four years old by a group of jounin. Word is the kid fended them off well enough on his own, but when his father got there. I saw those remains. Not pretty. So, a word of advice. Keep non-threatening around Kakashi's son, or he may well dismember you. Just a friendly warning, chirped the purple-haired girl happily. As Sasuke-kun's already cut him, Sakura stuttered, worried enough to talk to these big, scarred ninja who scared the pee out of her. There was a quiet pause. Well, so much for the Uchiha clan, the woman said, turning away. He's doomed. The clan is finished. Totally, the Sanban flicked and he showed such promise, Asuma-sensei said regretfully. They grinned at each other before the purple-haired woman turned to the kids and made shooing motions. Well, off you go. Hustle. The poor confused little Jenin scurried away, and Anko smirked at her companions. So Ikul Narachan is actually a Jenin now? Hands up, who actually thought Kakashi would let him graduate any time before he was thirty? Asuma grinned around his cigarette. Genma laughed outright. Well, I'm off, the Samban wielder said brightly. Asuma frowned at him. Where are you going? He asked. Genma snickered. To tell Guy. Who better than the green beast to make a fuss? This will be brilliant. Anko's smile was evil enough to make angels swoon. Make sure you get him to congratulate the whole Hataki family, in a very, very public place. I'll get the camera, Asuma said, ditching his half-finished sig in the dirt and hurrying away. I'll get hate and you go, Anko said, following. Left alone, Genma grinned. And I'll get Guy. Chapter 13. Rebuilding Bridges Burnt. Ten years old still. This is so stupid, Naruto grumbled under his breath. 
Shut up, brat. Hissed a voice in his ear. Yeah. He'll hear you. Added a different voice. Naruto rolled his eyes. Oh. That would be a tragedy, he drawled. Naruto, just bear with it. We're almost done, said a patiently exasperated voice this time. But dad, Naruto began in a whine. Positive ID on the target, Sasuke interrupted, talking over the younger genin. Bow on the left ear, Tora on the collar tag. Good. Move to intercept, now. Kakashi ordered over the comm unit. He watched as his three chibis leapt at the small gray animal they were stalking. It yelled when Naruto snatched it up, holding it around its middle and scooping it up against his chest, the same way he lifted puppies. The cat didn't take kindly to being grabbed, and hissed, raking its claws down Naruto's tan arm and face. Kakashi jerked, stepping forwards before he could stop himself, ready to tear the creature away from his son if it had hurt him. A cat could damage quite a bit and a ten-year-old could scar, could blind them easily. Naruto yelped, then growled and dangled the struggling creature at arm's length by its scruff, scowling at it. We wasted an entire afternoon rescuing this? He asked, adorably disgusted. Sakura took the animal and bundled it against her chest, pinning it so it couldn't scratch or bite. It settled reasonably quickly, content to glower at Naruto through her arms. Kakashi jumped down next to the trio, nodding. Good work, people, he said brightly. He paused by Naruto, tilting the boy's chin up to examine the four long scratch marks along his cheek, crossing the scars already adorning his face. Do these hurt Naruto? Naruto jerked away, flushing red. Kakashi spotted his furtive glance at his teammates, as well as Sasuke's condescending sneer. I'm fine, the blonde said quickly, brushing his father's hand away, the scratch is already closing. Kakashi smiled apologetically and sighed internally. He might have to cut back on the babying. Naruto wasn't a toddler anymore, no, now he was a genin. Only a few years away from that dreaded chunin rank. But it was incredibly hard. No matter how he knew intellectually that it was time to loosen his hold and start to trust his son a little, he couldn't help himself. Every time he saw the little blonde upset or hurt, he flashed right back to that horrible day when someone had taken his baby, and the same feelings he had experienced that day rushed back. That all-consuming, mindless urge to protect and shelter the child. He knew, knew, that he was holding the boy too close, but he just couldn't help it. He had spent the last six years hovering over him as if he was still four, overprotecting him to the point of smothering, though in a way Naruto was sure not to notice. After all, those trips out of the village, those long hours spent teaching him to be deadly. Naruto would be the first to declare that his father had been more than liberal with him. Never mind that the training was to ensure that Naruto remained out of public eye and well within the bounds of a Hataki prodigy, not to mention kept out of harm's way and safe under his father's proverbial lock and key for hours on end. Likewise, he was totally unaware that the beloved field trips were only so common because Kakashi didn't trust the academy staff to watch over the blonde, and typically lasted around a fortnight before he started fretting incessantly and removed Naruto from school altogether. After a week, or two, or three, of Naruto all to himself and safe in isolation, Kakashi's mind would be able to convince his protective instincts that it was okay to try school again. So, in short, now Naruto was a genin he was going to start to notice the smothering, and wanted to stop. So he had to cut back on it. Easier said than done. Naruto fidgeted. His dad had gotten that faraway look in his eye again, meaning that he was once again lost in thought. It happened sometimes, and Naruto knew that he had roughly three minutes of total freedom before Kakashi came back to earth. In his youth, he had used the time to scribble on the walls and crayon. Now, his eyes narrowed and he glared at the demon cat in Sakura's arms, and a different way to spend the time crept into his mind. He grinned and gestured slowly for Sasuke's silence. The Uchiha looked about to say something scathing, and carefully took the cat from Sakura, pinning its jaws shut when it tried to hiss and bite him. Then he grinned wider and gestured for his teammates to follow. Or maybe it would be better to mother them all unbearably, and then slowly wean myself off it, Kakashi mused to himself. He nodded mentally, 
that small bit of him still nine and trotting around after Minato-sensei and arguing with Abito gave an evil chuckle and a chibi victory dance at the idea that he'd found the perfect way to make Abito's emo, Avenger, Naruto's arm injuring little cousin suffer. Decision made, Kakashi opened his mouth to tell his team to head back to the Hokage Tower to deliver the cat, and blinked when he realized he was totally alone. Then sighed. Damn brats, he muttered. Now if I were three genin, including Naruto, and I had a demon in cat's form with me, what would I do? A three-second pause. Shit. Smile, you're in big trouble. Sasuke and Sakura both cringed, Sakura more noticeably. Each edged backwards, away from their big, scary teacher. They were standing in the mission's room, and Kakashi-sensei had somehow managed to hiss that with such venom while still projecting an image of a happy, carefree man. Somehow, Naruto seemed immune to his threat. Come on, Dad, it was just an experiment, he said, eyes wandering around the mission's office, where the fight was taking place. Haven't you ever wondered if a cat will really always land on its feet? Kakashi smiled at the fuming woman who owned the cat they had retrieved and reached to subtly pinch his son's ear. It looked, and felt, like an inadequate reprimand, but it was a deceptively painful motion. I have, the father said carefully level. Even so, we do not mistreat other people's pets like that. You especially do not drop the cat you are supposed to be rescuing. If you must experiment, you torture your own animal to do it, understand? The biting sarcasm was enough to give anyone frostbite. Saratobi glanced up as he felt the edges of the chill even though he hadn't heard what Kakashi had said, but soon turned back to the shinobi ahead of Squad 7 in line, listening to his report. Naruto just looked confused. But I don't have a cat, he said. The closest I have is Pakin, and everyone knows dogs don't land on their feet, so dropping him off the water tower is dumb. Sasuke was sure he heard the Hokage give an exasperated sigh even if the old man didn't move or give any indication that he was eavesdropping. That Anbu in the corner was staring openly, either laughing behind his mask or astonished that the Hataki could aim so much carefully controlled anger at his treasured son. Kakashi sensei's eye narrowed further, but he didn't get a chance to do anything as Saratobi waved them forwards. Now, Squad 7. Thank you for waiting. I understand there was some problem with the mission. It was almost amusing the way Naruto smiled while his teammates flinched at the reminder. Kakashi, meanwhile, seemed torn between anger and fear, his single eye flicking to the two root A and B U members that Danzo thought Saratobi hadn't noticed were planted in the room. The old Hokage knew exactly what his concern was, and nodded quietly to the Jonin, giving his subtle permission to stage a show. The children thought it would be fun to experiment with the item to be retrieved, Kakashi said on cue. It was a wonder that his words didn't freeze and fall to the ground on their way out of his lips. Sure Jimmy, Tora's owner, bristled at the way he referred to her cat. Well, I never, she began, but Kakashi quickly turned to her and bowed low. Shijimi-sama, I apologize for the actions of my son. Please understand he did not mean any harm by it. He is too young to understand the consequences of his actions. That was a low blow, Sasuke realized dimly as he watched Naruto Brat's face color. The baby hated digs about his age and maturity. The pudgy woman clutching her traumatized cat scowled at the lot of them but seemed to melt as she fell victim to whatever spell Naruto's father was always able to weave over any member of the opposite gender. Naruto had personally long suspected black magic to be involved. Well, all right, she grumbled, breaking eye contact with the older Hitaki. Tora wasn't hurt, I suppose, so no harm then. Thank you, Shijimiheim, Kakashi said, charming and courteous despite the anger boiling under the surface. He bowed again as she after paying for the technically failed D-rank, left without much fuss. Sakura, who had begun to relax, squeaked and fled for nice, safe and rather pale Iruka-sensei when Kakashi-sensei turned back to his son. You little idiot, he said. Naruto blinked, taken aback. It was just... Animal cruelty? Willful property damage? Throwing a mission? Do you have any idea what the penalty is for throwing a mission? Sakura gasped and clutched at her former teacher, apparently the first of the children to connect their abuse of Tora with the laws that laid out harsh penalties for the shinobi who failed missions on purpose. 
The lightest of those punishments was a public beating, the most severe, rather more permanent chastisement. Whoa, you're really mad, Naruto said, taking a step backwards. Sasuke rolled his eyes, safely out of view of both Atakis. So now the idiot clued in on the killer intent filling the room. What were you doing? Kakashi pushed, stepping into Naruto's bubble and looming over him threateningly. I did not raise you to act like that. Kakashi, the Sandame said warningly, trying to deflect a little of the man's anger before he went overboard. Sasuke, Sakura, go out to training ground 37 and do some exercises. I'll join you eventually, he said, never glancing at them. Sakura looked at Iruka, who was holding her obligingly, and the Chunin nodded, looking worriedly at Naruto. Even Sasuke lost no time in leaving. The door closed behind the two genin with a quiet thump, and there was a dead silence in the room for a moment. Naruto's calm wavered, and his casual air faded, to be replaced with a vague fear of paternal wrath. It was just a cat, Dad, he said uncertainly. Kakashi twitched, and one hand shot out. Without any warning at all, he slapped his son across the face, in full view of the whole room. The root NBU in the southeast corner shifted a little. Naruto stumbled back a step, hands snapping up to cover his cheek and blue eyes staring in absolute shock. A whisper went through the paperwork shunin. Iruka stood up. Hataki-san, there is no cause for that, he said indignantly. Naruto Kuen acted in an age-appropriate display of immaturity. You shouldn't berate him so harshly for a first-time mission failure. Stay out of this, teacher, growled the father. I have zero tolerance for purposefully failing missions. Hokage-sama, Iruka protested, appealing to the old man. This is why I said that Kakashi-san shouldn't be Naruto Kuen's teacher. Nepotism aside, it's obvious that he's too harsh on. That's enough, Iruka. Sarutobi's voice held all the authority of his rank, enough to make even the willful teacher fall silent. We are not debating Kakashi's right as Jounin sensei again. That matter is closed. Kakashi, I think this is a family matter, so please remove yourself and your son. Settle this behind closed doors before returning. Kakashi nodded shortly. Come with me, he growled, grabbing Naruto's shoulder and dragging him out of the missions room before the genin could register what was going on. In fairness, though, Naruto's mind was still stuck on that slap and how unexpected it had been. It didn't take long for Kakashi to find an empty conference room a few doors down the hallway, and he pushed his son ahead of him into it, closing the door securely behind him. There was a long moment of silence. I'm sorry for yelling at you, especially like that in public. Naruto flinched away from the hand Kakashi brought up to touch him face contorting with the effort it took to hold back tears. Oh, Naruto, Kakashi sighed. I'm sorry, baby. I shouldn't have hit you, even if I was trying to. It took a moment of coaxing to get Naruto gathered against his chest. Why, why was it such a big deal? The boy asked. It was just a D-rank, just a cat. He sounded so confused and forlorn that Kakashi hated himself. It wasn't fair that Naruto suffered like this especially for things that had happened so long ago. I wonder if Saratobi even remembered my family history when he assigned you to me, pup. Naru, our family, we really can't afford to throw missions, love. Naruto sniffed angrily, scrubbing at his face. Why? He said bitterly. Because of the genius thing? Does that mean I can't have fun? We weren't actually gonna hurt the stupid cat. I had a clone at the bottom to catch it, and it wasn't that far to fall and then we were gonna give it back. And you stopped us anyway, like I knew you would. I was just doing it to tease you. So who cares? For a moment, Kakashi hesitated. Then he decided to tell someone the truth, for the first time in his life. He had suspected he would have to confide in Naruto when he first saw Danzo, village king bastard winner eight years running. The main thorn in Kakashi's side his entire life watching Naruto cheerfully climbing that water tower in an effort to completely disobey his mission orders. It's not that, he said. It's because of your grandfather. Naruto stilled in his arms. Grandpa? Kakashi nodded, even if Naruto couldn't see the motion. Uh Uh-huh. Most people think that he was the cause of the Third Great Shinobi War. With one jerk, 
Naruto tore himself out of the embrace and looked up in horror at his father's hidden face. Was he? He demanded. Kakashi shook his head. No, he said, not really. But he was sent on a mission that he threw, and as a fallout the war that had been brewing for years was declared. He threw that mission to save his teammates' lives, not for a joke, but he was still made a pariah. Eventually it became too much, and he killed himself to escape the village's judgment. I was eight when he died and ever since then I've been watched very closely for evidence of the same foul play. When I came home with you I was even audited by the council. Twice. Just to make sure I hadn't strayed outside the parameters of my mission. I want to break the chain of scrutiny with you, if I can. Naruto's expression wavered. With me? Kakashi nodded. I came down on you very hard then, in front of everyone, to build credibility. To give everyone who was there a good reason to think that you'll go out of your way to avoid throwing another mission. I will, Naruto instantly vowed, one hand reaching up to cup his cheek. That hurt. Kakashi bit back another apology. Naruto wouldn't appreciate it, especially not with his body language suddenly changing with the unpredictability of youth to say I'm a big tough boy and I wasn't just crying. Come on, he said brightly, making a physical effort to let go of him. Let's get a new mission and they go find the others, okay? Cheer up. Naruto nodded, allowing Kakashi to pull away and stand back up. Dad? He said in a small voice. I'm sorry. For the last mission. Kakashi considered. I forgive you, he said. Hang your head and we'll go back to beg Hokage-sama for another task, eh? Half an hour later, Naruto, bruised cheek fading faster than it could darken, was happily walking a big dog with his father right beside him and Sasuke and Sakura a suitably spooked distance behind them. Not long after the cat mission, Sakura arrived at the designated meeting spot just after eight in the morning, because, really, who was going to get mad at her? Kakashi-sensei was always at least twenty minutes behind schedule, and Naruto was always with him, and Sasuke, well, Sasuke had probably been there since 0730, but he'd be well and truly into his morning warm-up so he'd ignore her like he usually. The girl stopped short when she spotted Sasuke, who was this morning standing on the red bridge, eyes fixed on Naruto. The littler boy was completely oblivious, but he was present. He was sitting cross-legged on the splintered wood planks of the bridge, a workbook out and open in front of him. From the way his fingers were flicking, keeping place, it looked like he was in the midst of a tricky mathematics problem. A quick look around showed no Kakashi in sight. Sakura sidled up to her crush. Sasuke-kun? How long has he been? He was here when I got here, the Uchiha replied, sounding as unnerved as she felt. Where's? Not here, Sasuke finished before she could, looking around again as if to be sure that Kakashi hadn't appeared. Then why is Naruto? I have no idea. The pair stood in silence each keenly aware that Naruto on his own in a secluded part of the village like this was something that never happened. Finally, Sakura could stand it no longer. Naruto-chan. She called, trotting forwards. The blonde boy looked up and smiled at her. Good morning, Sakura, he said brightly. Then he blinked. Wait, Chan? His face darkened. Don't call me that. It's Naruto-kun or Naruto, we've been over this. Sorry, Sakura conceded quickly, settling down next to the boy. What are you doing? Homework, Naruto replied calmly. There was a sort of universal blink shared by both of his teammates. We're out of the academy, brat, Sasuke commented, coming forwards as well. Naruto made a face at him. I wondered how long you were going to stand there and stare like a creeper, he said. Welcome back to animation, O oh statue impersonator. Sasuke resisted the urge to sweat the brat around the ears and see if it knocked out some cheek. The last time he'd struck out at Naruto, he'd become the enemy of an infamous jounin and had an ex-teacher pronounce him to be a dead man walking. Where's Kakashi? He asked shortly instead. Naruto shrugged. Dunno. He went out on a mission last night. Pakin, he was the one who watched me, well, officially, but I totally noticed the ANBU he made watch me outside the window. Anyway, Packin said that he'd meet us here. He goes on missions without us? Squeaked Sakura, sounding indignant. Sasuke felt similarly, but
but held his tongue. Naruto blinked at her. Duh, he said. Dad's been working two jobs since, oh, like forever. Since the ANBU had to take over policing the village, and got all overworked, and Dad's a really strong jonin, so they send him away on high-ranked missions all the time. Sasuke felt cold. Naruto was talking about the night his family had died, however obliquely. Thankfully, either of his teammates made the same connection, and neither looked at him in that moment. So why the maths? Sakura was asking. Naruto blinked at her. I told you, homework. I have to finish it, or I'll get into trouble. Sakura smiled in an attempt at gently. What she got was condescending, and Naruto gritted his teeth against it. She's not doing it on purpose, he reminded himself glumly. Naruto, she said, you don't have to do homework anymore. Iruka-sensei won't care, you've graduated. Naruto looked her over with incredulity. It's not for Iruka-sensei, he said. My dad sets homework for me to do, every Sunday. I give him my week's work to check over and he assigns a new set for me to do. Welcome to the world of overachieving genius when it procreates. Sakura giggled. Naruto had sounded so depressed when he said that. It was cute. Then she felt a surge of pity because, well, maths. Kakashi-sensei was evil. I'm glad he's not my dad, she admitted, still giggling away. Naruto wrinkled his nose at her, but didn't comment. Sasuke held his tongue too despite how much he wanted to say that he wished Kakashi wasn't Naruto's father either. It had become clear in the last weeks that Kakashi had a very low opinion of Sasuke. The Uchiha was regretting that bladed show of temper against baby Hitaki during the exam more and more with each passing hour. Not that the teacher was openly hostile. In fairness, it did seem that Kakashi was trying to be a fair and even teacher. However, the deep-seated dislike that had taken root the moment Naruto's blood had spilt made unbiased lessons impossible. Sasuke hated taijutsu practice, an activity he used to enjoy, because fights with Sakura didn't extend him, fights with Kakashi were more like beatings, and fights with Naruto had him pulling punches and breaking into nervous sweats as Kakashi fixed that one gray eye on him and flipped a kanai in his hand over and over. Ninjutsu was worse in a way, as Kakashi would instruct the whole group with lessons that seemed to be tailored to what Naruto could achieve. This was probably not a conscious decision, but rather Kakashi using what he knew from his son about children's abilities and matching them to the youngest, and presumably least developed, of the group. Unfortunately, what he came up with was hard. Walking up trees in the first week, walking on water in the second. Sakura took to the activity like a duck to water, almost literally, Sasuke had mused sourly as he watched her windmill her arms to keep upright while bobbing up and down over waves on the lake. He and Naruto had more trouble, but Naruto got active coaching, probably at home as well as during official training hours, and someone to catch him when he fell from high branches. Sasuke had rubbed his bruises and tried to apply the advice his teacher had given him, while ignoring the frost that the adult hadn't quite managed to erase from its delivery. Genjutsu was glossed over entirely. Sasuke had a feeling that the Hataki family as a whole had little patience for it, which was a pity because it was an activity that would have suited the disproportionate level of attention each student received. Naruto would need the most help, Sakura, who excelled, the next most to extend her. And Sasuke just some instructions and room to practice. It was an impossible dilemma. He needed to advance to stand even a chance of killing his brother. He was beyond the level of individual study. He needed a teacher to get any further. And his teacher was completely disinterested in him, at best. The twelve-year-old Uchiha knew one thing for sure, something had to give. The worst part was that it didn't even seem to be conscious. Kakashi probably hadn't noticed how unfair he was, just like he probably didn't know just how smotheringly overprotective he came across as. His musing was interrupted by the arrival of the very man he was mentally complaining about. Dad! Brad exclaimed, jumping to his feet and rolling his workbook into a thin tube which he stuck in his shuriken holster. Kakashi smiled, or seemed to, and put a hand on his kid's head. Hello, pup. How was your night? Were you okay by yourself? Naruto rolled his eyes. Oh, yeah? It was great. Just a quiet... Private night, just me, a dog, and four ANBU hiding badly outside. 
The Jounin didn't have the grace to look abashed. It's for your own good, kid, he said happily. Okay. On to today's work. I think it's time for some nice, fun, deranks. Naruto and Sakura groaned in tandem, but trudged in the direction of the Hokage Tower when Kakashi flicked his hands at them in a shoe motion. Sasuke stood still, wanting to try for a moment alone with his teacher. Kakashi made as if to follow a few yards behind his squad, then seemed to realize that a third of it was missing. Sasuke? What's the matter? He asked, tone cool but not hostile. Sasuke hesitated, but lifted his chin and met his teacher's eyes. Sensei, I was wondering, is there anyone in the village who's a, a taijutsu specialist? Kakashi's face didn't change, but he answered easily enough. Why, yes there is. Meito Gai Sensei, Kanoha's green beast. He's the village's leading expert in taijutsu. Sasuke grimaced. Okay, he wasn't going there. How about a weapons specialist? He asked. Maybe he could beg training off that person instead. It was on the tip of Kakashi's tongue to tell the Uchiha about Anko and her Saban, but something made him pause. The hope in the whelp's face was telling, he wanted to go elsewhere for his training, to double dip. That wasn't a good idea. Two training regimes at the same time would exhaust a twelve-year-old. Besides, I think you're good enough with weapons, Kakashi said coldly, and Sasuke flushed, knowing he was talking about the attack on Naruto. Now come on, let's catch the others up. Bang went that idea, Sasuke thought as he begrudgingly followed Kakashi to the Hokage Tower. His teacher wasn't going to pawn him off on anyone else, apparently, so Sasuke had to come up with a way back onto Kakashi's good side. But how? The answer came to him halfway through weeding Cairo Tamanaka's very overgrown garden. He gritted his teeth against the idea and searched his mind for another one. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't. It would hurt his pride an unprecedented amount, and give Naruto Brat way too much power over him. He wouldn't. And yet, as time went on and the sun climbed higher, no other solution presented itself. And Sasuke had to resolve this grudge his teacher bore against him. He had to. Is my pride more important than my will to avenge my family? He asked himself. It was a hard question to answer honestly. Finally deciding that the answer was no, the last Uchiha straightened, set aside his trowel and wiped away the sweat beaded on his upper lip. The blonde baby was kneeling on the other end of the garden, with his father hovering near him. He was hacking stubbornly at a sapling tree that had taken root where it oughtn't have. Swallowing saliva and pride both, Sasuke approached the youngest member of his team. Kakashi noticed him instantly, of course, and shifted a little as if to prepare to defend. The Uchiha tried not to be offended that he had blipped his teacher's threat to Naruto radar. Offense wouldn't help. Hey, pass me that shovel, would you? The blonde said to the man, oblivious. It was Sasuke who reached for the tool and held it out to his teammate. He took a breath and tried to pretend that Kakashi wasn't in the tree a ways behind him. Naruto looked understandably surprised to see Sasuke helping him. Bra Naruto. The words sounded rusty and used. Now Naruto looked worried. Yeah. Sasuke gritted his teeth, then decided to just get it over with. I'm sorry, he blurted. The rest came out in a rush. For what happened in the Genin exam. I shouldn't have attacked you. It was wrong. I made a mistake. I let my temper get the better of me and I'm sorry there. If that wasn't good enough, Sasuke didn't know what to do. He'd blatantly asked for forgiveness. Naruto's eyes flicked in indecision, obviously trying to decide if the older boy was jerking his chain or not. Then he tried to decide if he would accept the offered apology. Sasuke was mean and grumpy and a bully more than half of the time. But Naruto's good nature and excellent upbringing made him remember his manners. Uh, it's okay. No hard feelings. He held out his hand. Sasuke stared at the offered limb hanging in the air. Finally, he took it, a quick but firm handshake. History was made. Chapter 14 For Want of a Nail 11 years old Kakashi was reclining on a sturdy tree branch, observing his team from a small distance. Currently, they were bickering over the correct way to differentiate garden plants, herbs, and weeds. Their employer who was being a much more attentive babysitter than the jounin, 
settled the dispute with a solid knock to the head apiece from his broom. He flashed a grin at Kakashi, who grinned back. The old civilian employer was actually one of the lucky few ANBU to make it to retirement true. I'm old now I am going to sit on the porch and yell at kids' retirement, not the kick you out of Black Ops brand Kakashi had been subjected to. He had actually been one of Kakashi's teachers back in the day, years ago now, and had been delighted with the opportunity to force the spawn of that once devil child to manual labor. The kids had no idea, clinging to the belief that he was just another grumpy old man. Maybe he was, in a way. And hey, ex-ninjas still needed their gardens weeded. And Kakashi could just sit and enjoy the peace. Quit it, brat. Sasuke-kun. I know what I'm doing. Or not. Kakashi sighed as his comrade broke up yet another fight, this one over the proper use of a trowel that Naruto had stolen from Sakura to use on Sasuke's particularly stubborn weed. The peculiar truce that Sasuke had attempted to instate a few weeks or was it months? A go had all but dissolved. Truth was, the Avenger just didn't have it in him to be nice, and Naruto had too little patience to deal with someone so recalcitrant. Sakura only added to the problem, stressing both boys with her fangirling over Sasuke and her high-handed babying of Naruto. Of course, he knew the reasoning. Officially, the best male and female graduate had been paired with the early graduate, to protect him. In reality, they had been grouped in an effort to keep the fatalities down should Naruto be attacked again. The theory was that as the best the academy could offer, Sasuke and Sakura had a chance of looking after themselves when assassins came out to play. Or something. Sighing again over his lot in life, Kakashi reached into his vest and pulled out a book and a letter. The book was from his father's office, a romance just touching the wrong side of Ranchi. It had a fairly good storyline, but the knowledge of who had owned it first seriously weirded him out, so he hadn't made it very far in. The letter was addressed to him, sent from the medical wing of the Hirakanwa outpost. Rin had sent him a tentative letter six months ago, written with a kind of formal language that told Kakashi how nervous she was about contacting him. His reply, though short and almost painfully blunt, had somehow opened the gates for a flood. Sometimes he found two or three letters a week in his pigeonhole at the tower quite a feat, as the outpost only mailed personal correspondence monthly. It was okay, though. Slowly it seemed like they were repairing some damage. It was easier to do through a medium like letters rather than face to face, anyway. Sensei? Kakashi automatically covered the letter and looked down at Sakura, standing dirt smudged and tired below him. Yes, Sakura? We're done, Sensei. I think. It took a moment to convince his limbs to move from their comfortable position, but he abandoned his perch and jumped down next to her. A glance around showed she spoke the truth, and he reached out to tousle his son's hair. Good job, kids. Looking at his once teacher, he said, Are you satisfied, Wadabi san? The old bastard grinned at him. Yes, Jonan san, that should do, he replied. It was a pleasure to have you all. Those kids are a bit unruly, though. Kakashi glared but said nothing. The old shinobi had satisfied his curiosity over Kakashi's students and progeny and was apparently pleased with what he had found. No doubt this would be spread around the old fart gossip circle until they were inundated with deranked requests from all the old-timers crawling out of the woodwork to poke at the new generation. Okay, enough missions for today. Let's go to training ground 42. I think it's time to learn something, he said to his genin. The way they perked up was somewhat amusing, especially as he was planning on handing each of them a kunai and telling them to walk up a tree again. They'd been getting good at the whole chakra balance on vertical surfaces, so he was going to make them try on chakra-sensitive plants that tended to push back and unbalance little Jenin tottering along with chakra footsteps. We'll see how happy you all are then. I feel an evil laugh coming on. The squad was lined up in formation when the captain arrived. He looked along the line, making sure he had everyone assigned to him. There were pale faces and nervous looks after all, what they were about to do was extremely dangerous, and they had no idea if they could trust their untried teammates to pull through for them when it got tough. Okay, the captain said, looking once more down the line. Any last-minute problems before we go? An uncomfortable silence. Then, their youngest member a boy barely sixteen spoke up. Are we sure we want to do this? 
I mean, Hataki is a really hard target, and it doesn't seem like there's much reward. Coward. This is for your village, hissed another. The captain waved his hand. For silence before anything could escalate. That's enough. Hiro is not a coward, his concerns are valid. But our orders are absolute. A henceforth silent Kunoichi chuckled. That leaf bastard will never see this coming. Like father, like son. Let's go, the captain said. Less than a second later, every one of them disappeared into the wind. Another day, another wait in the queue at the mission's desk. Kakashi slouched in line, one hand on Sakura's shoulder in an attempt to keep her from launching herself at Sasuke, who had apparently had his hair cut yesterday afternoon. The change was barely noticeable, but the female member of the squad approved, vocally. Sasuke was attempting to ignore the attention, poorly, as they slowly trickled through the tower towards the shinobi that would assign their day's work. Finally, finally, they reached the front of the line. Iruka was manning it today, using up his paid time until the start of the next school year. Ah, Squad 7, he said when they drew near. Here for a mission? Yup, Kakashi said, bumping Sasuke with a shin. The Uchiha glanced at him in confusion before remembering that he had a task to perform today. He approached the desk and offered a scroll his mission report. Kakashi had decided it was time they learned to write them, and had arbitrarily chosen Sasuke to be the first to attempt it. He had been made to rewrite it three times before Kakashi had been satisfied. Iruka took the scroll and smiled. Another successful D-rank? Yes, sensei, Sakura piped up in Sasuke's place, drawing herself up with pride. What mission are we getting next? Naruto asked, standing on tiptoes to get an angle where he could read the scrolls on the desk upside down. A C-rank? Kakashi stifled a flinch at the notion a second too late, if the amused smirks of the desk workers were any indication. Iruka chose to answer. I don't think so, Naruto-kun. But we have a fun one. There's an orchard just outside the village wall that's asked for a genin team to help harvest the fruit. Should last several days, and you'll get paid out of village rates, even though it's close enough to come home every night. We'll take it, Kakashi said before Naruto could express his distaste. It didn't take long to be briefed. Basically, this particular apple orchard was run by a gentleman farmer, which was a polite way of saying someone who didn't want to work a day in his life. So every year, at harvest time, a genin team was employed to pick and sort the apples. How thrilling. Still, Kakashi supposed, a change of scenery might entertain the kids. So he ignored Naruto's pout, signed the roster to say he'd accepted this mission, and shepherded the trio out. Dad, why do genin have to do such dumb stuff? Naruto half-whined. Kakashi decided to treat it as a legitimate query from his student rather than a complaint from his son. Well. It teaches you a variety of skills that would otherwise need to be taught in potentially deadly situations that you would be cast into prematurely. It also. Give me the version that has the BS removed, Naruto interrupted. Kakashi grinned. Teaches you to obey orders no matter how dumb or degrading they are, and means the grown-ups don't have to do chores. Naruto nodded. Thought so, he said, ducking to avoid his dad's hair ruffle. Kakashi stopped to buy a packed lunch for everyone from a food stall on the way. There really wasn't time to go home and pack something, but there were no food shops in the orchard, and Kakashi would be frankly shocked if they even saw another soul, let alone were offered food on the job. And he couldn't very well let thirteen-year-olds go a whole day without food on a deranked mission. Or buy Naruto a lunch and not the other two. Besides, little gestures to make the other two feel loved meant he could skip the big gestures. They reached the village gates just as what looked like a three-man chunin squad and client did. Kakashi gave them a vague nod and received one in return from the heavyset chunin. He would have kept right on walking, but his genin had other ideas. Daikoku sensei Sakura called, ever the social butterfly. How she remembered the name of the academy teacher she hadn't interacted with since she was six was a mystery for the ages, but the chubby man smiled readily enough. Hello, Sakura-chan, Sasuke-kun, Daikoku greeted, looking at each in turn. Naruto-chan, Kakashi-san. Off on a mission? Yes, Sensei Sakura said. Naruto tried not to react badly to the fact that he'd just been called Chan, even though he was nearly eleven. 
We're going to pick fruit, he said instead. Daikoku chuckled. That sounds fun, he said. What are you doing, sensei? asked Sasuke, dark eyes flicking between the teacher and the two other chunin, who were obviously his teammates, talking to a civilian nearby. The chubby teacher smiled. Well, I've been assigned a mission, along with those two, he said, gesturing the men Sasuke had spotted. We are escorting a client home. That sounds interesting, Sakura offered half-heartedly and untruthfully, eyeing the scruffy man by the gate arguing with the chunin. Both green-vested men had rather long-suffering expressions in place. In the background, Kakashi smirked. C-ranks were the bane of the adult shinobi world. Once they aged out of D-ranks, got promoted to chunin, it was no longer weeding gardens and painting fences. Instead, the dreaded escort mission stepped in as the most tedious, dreary and downright cringe-worthy torture that the desk need could inflict. Daikoku shot him a sour look, no doubt guessing what the jounin was thinking. How are you coping with your new genin team, sensei? He said, mostly out of spite, drawing attention to the jounin's own torture. Kakashi's answer was blithe. Well enough. Where are you headed, sensei? Daikoku grimaced. Just a wave and back. Not far. Izumo and Kotetsu will handle most of the heavy lifting. They're younger than me. Well, good luck. And you? And they were off. The Chunin, Izumo, and Kotetsu? Stop arguing with the client when Team 7 walked past, each ducking into a bizarrely low bow aimed at Kakashi. The Jounin was a little bemused by the overdone manners until he remembered that those two had come with him that day he had rescued Naruto from his abductors years ago. I didn't realize I made such an impression on them, he thought, gleeful at the idea. I wonder if they'll call me Kakashi-sama? The Hyuga clan compound was designed to exude tranquility. Unlike the Inazuka compound, which leaked life by the bucketful, or the Uchiha compound, which had been designed to showcase power, or the Yamanaka compound, which was designed to accommodate its civilian businesses, the Hyuga were all about calm, peace, and pretty koi ponds. The private home of the clan head was no different. There were soundproofed walls, ordered flowers, sweeping hallways. And today, two children fighting bitterly in the garden. Hinata was sitting on the porch, peeking through her fingers as she watched Niji Nizan and her baby sister Hanabi spar. Hanabi was panting, but the glint in her eyes was furious as she attacked her cousin with everything she had. Niji, on the other hand, had set his face in a blank slate of seriousness, but Hinata knew he was equal parts resigned and annoyed. Hanabi had come to him and demanded a spar. When Niji had refused, tired from his own training, the girl had pulled rank. Hinata shifted uncomfortably. It was incredibly bad taste for someone so young to pull down part of the main branch card on her senior, but Hanabi was all too comfortable doing so. She was also too confident in her abilities. Where most days Niji would be gentle with her, today he clearly just wanted this fight over with so he could go and rest. He managed to disarm and unbalance his cousin within ten minutes, and sent her tumbling to the ground with one last strike. Relaxing his fighting pose, he moved to stand over the young girl. You should yield, he said. It was obvious he had won. An ugly expression came over Hanabi's face, and Niji had just enough time to form an uneasy feeling before the brand on his forehead flared to life. With a muted scream, he fell to his knees, blinded by the agony. Hanabi! Hinata shouted, horrified. Niji's face was twisted grotesquely, his hands clutching at his head. Hanabi clambered to her feet and made a show of standing over him, smirking. Yield, Niji gasped. I yield. Hanabi didn't stop, if anything intensifying her focus on keeping his seal active. Hanada felt her heart jump into her throat. She's going to kill him, she thought wildly. Niji apparently reached a similar conclusion, that, or he couldn't stand the pain anymore. He forced one hand away from his head and picked up a kunai hurling it with all his might at the young girl. Hanabi skipped out of the way, but it broke her focus and Niji jumped to his feet. Hanabi let out a little scream as her cousin bowled into her. It wasn't a ninja attack, it was closer to a big brother tackle. The boy pushed her to the ground, grabbed a handful of her hair and yanked, twisted her arm back painfully. 
He was probably keeping himself from using any proper fighting techniques in case he killed the little girl, but that didn't stop him from trying to hurt her back in a moment of petty revenge. You asked me to spar, he shouted into her ear. You ordered me to spar with you. Don't punish me because you lost. Hinata had both hands over her mouth. She didn't know what to do as her little sister screamed. Hanabi was making enough ruckus to wake the dead, which seemed unfair as Niji wasn't even really hurting her. He had barely made a peep when she had been melting his brain. A tray with four cups of tea balanced on it slammed down next to her, and Hinata looked up to see her father stride past, jump the foot down off the porch to the garden, and stalk to the two squalling on the ground. Niji struggled when he was grabbed and hauled off of his cousin, but went limp the moment he realized who had come to intervene. His face changed from angry to horrified as he looked back at Hanabi and realized what he'd done. Automatically, his hand went to the cursed seal in preparation for when his uncle activated it. High as she would, he knew. But he didn't. Instead, he set Niji roughly on his feet and scowled. Hanabi clambered back to her feet, making a show of how sore her twisted arm was. The smug look on her face left no doubt that she believed he was about to be punished severely. Niji, Hayashi said. His heart was pounding with the worst kind of anger. At Niji, yes, but also at his daughter. How dare you attack Hanabi? Have you anything to say? For a moment, just a moment, Niji looked like he was going to defend himself, accuse Hanabi of activating the cursed seal for nothing. Then, a horrible defeat entered his eyes and he tilted his head down just enough that he no longer met Hayashi's eyes. No, sir. Hayashi narrowed his own eyes. Self-control is the most important asset a shinobi can have, he said. No matter how angry you are, you are never to lose control of yourself again. As you cannot control yourself, I shall isolate you until you can. I expect you to go straight to my dojo in the east wing. You are to lock the door behind you. You are to stay and practice there until I come and release you. You are not to stop for food or drink, or for any other reason. Do I make myself quite clear? Niji's face was set, but Hayashi could see how upset he was. Once that dojo was locked, he would have no choice but to stay. It could only be unlocked from the outside. And it was incredibly unfair to tell him he wasn't allowed to stop to rest or refuel, especially as he had no idea how long he'd be there. Still, Hayashi watched as the boy steeled himself and answered. Yes, uncle. He even kept his voice steady. Go, Hayashi said, before he crumbled and recanted. Yes, perhaps it was unfair to punish and belittle the boy, but he couldn't go around attacking the main branch of the clan. He'd be killed outright, and Hayashi wasn't always going to be around to protect him. I will find out if you disobey me. Niji nodded once, bowed, and left. Hayashi watched him go, and was perturbed but unsurprised to see him scrub his eyes with his knuckles just before he was out of sight. Hinata was still sitting frozen on the porch, looking as if she desperately wanted to say something but was too afraid to. She also looked like she was going to burst into tears at any moment. Unfortunately, Hayashi wasn't done being the bad guy yet. He turned to his youngest, who was trying to put her hair back in order and looking altogether too smug about Niji's fate. Hayashi felt another surge of anger, and wondered how he had raised such a vindictive little bitch. Hanabi, he said sternly. I am displeased with you. She looked surprised. But he attacked me. She protested. High as she raised an eyebrow. Did you, or did you not activate his seal when you lost the spar? He said. Hanabi didn't even have the grace to look cowed. A light blush appeared over her cheeks, but she didn't look away. Instead, she had the audacity to shrug. I don't think I lost, she said. I found a way to win, I took it. I could have killed him when he was down under the seal. He yielded, high as she thought, and you still didn't let him go. Hanabi, you are talented, but not yet skilled enough to defeat Niji. In fact, I doubt you will ever be able to best him in a fair he stressed the word fight. Hanabi's face changed from smug to incredulous, and Hayashi went in for the kill. I have never seen a main branch member act so disgracefully. You will spend the rest of today and all of tomorrow helping your branch relatives in the kitchens, and then every afternoon and weekend until I am satisfied you will never again use their seal against them unjustly. 
Hanabi opened her mouth to protest the punishment. Shivu had never set foot in the kitchens, let alone done any other chore her entire life. But Hayashi cut her off. And, he said, drawing out the word to be sure he caught and kept her attention, while you are scrubbing dishes, I want you to think on this. You are the second child of the clan head. Should your sister succeed me, you will be branded with that same seal you now abuse. That pulled the little brat up short, and she stared in horror at her father. Hayashi felt a twinge of guilt at the emotional blackmail, but he couldn't let her go around torturing her family. That would just end with her becoming a little psychopath, if he let it go on unchecked. Hinata made a soft sound of distress as well, but Hayashi backed his resolve and made sure to keep his most severe face in place. I suggest you go now, he said, purposefully making his voice tight, as if he were just barely controlling his temper. Present yourself at the kitchens, and be sure you explain the full reason you are there. I shall come check on you shortly. Hanada would have burst into tears at this point. Hanabi showed her individuality by clenching her jaw, tossing her nose into the air and stalking away. Her father watched her go and sighed. What am I going to do with that girl? Putting the problem aside, he approached the porch and sat down next to his eldest daughter. Hinata, he said, retrieving the tea tray he had set down and offering her a steaming cup. Tell me how your training is going. Her stuttering had improved a little, as he'd hoped it might, since she'd been put on that young Kunoichi squad. But today, after seeing such an extreme family argument, her speech impediment was out in full force. Um, W.L., W.E. have be been learning a lots, F.F. father. Hayashi looked into the green tea in his hand and sighed. Niji hated him, Hanada feared him, Hanabi resented him. He was three for three. Well, they are teenagers, or nearly, he thought. I wonder how the other clan heads deal with this sort of thing. Naruto stared at it. Day one of the fruit-picking mission, and something was wrong. A forehead protector was lying on the ground, unclaimed, half buried in leaves. The others were ahead, probably already up trees again filling their buckets with ripe fruit. He had gone back to the big storage barn to empty his bucket, and had spotted it on the way back. He frowned, looking around. There was no one around, no one to claim the lost to tight. He squinted at the innocent cloth. No traps that he could see either. Just an abandoned scrap half buried by leaves. Decision made, his hand darted out and fished it up out of the dirt. Metal glinted as he shook the ribbon out to scatter leaves, and he flicked it up so he was holding the body of the piece. Wonder if it's one of Dad's, he thought, noting that it was bent on an angle that would fit an adult head and so couldn't belong to him or his teammates. He turned it over in his hands, looking for a clue as to its owner, and froze. The shiny metal was engraved, but not with the familiar spiral of his hometown. Instead, three flattened bubbles were stamped into it, sparking memories of horrible moments in his youth. His hand jerked, grip slackening. The Hitai bounced on the ground, and Naruto backed away like it was poisoned. Kumo. The Hitai was from Kumo. Why was it here? For a moment, the image of the four men who had tried to take him so long ago swam in his vision images no doubt exaggerated and made grotesque by time and fear. Those men had been his own personal bogeyman for years, even though Dad had assured him they would never be back. What if they had come back now? To try and steal him? A bolt of fear twanged through his gut, and Naruto flinched. After a moment of hesitation, he grabbed up the enemy marker again and ran to the house. Dad. Kakashi looked up. Naruto. I was wondering where you went. He frowned at his son's expression. You okay, pup? Naruto spotted Sasuke looking over curiously and took a deep breath, restraining himself. He wanted to throw himself at his father and babble, but his pride would never let him. Instead, he offered the Hitaite. I found this. Kakashi's gloved hand took the Hitaite gently, turning it over to see the symbol. For one moment, the Jounin froze. Where did you find this? He said in a tightly controlled voice. Naruto bit his lip. Outside. It was kinda half-buried, like it had been forgotten. Go back to work. I'll take care of it, Kakashi rasped. Nothing to worry about. A bit of relief entered Naruto's eyes, and Kakashi forced a smile. 
He rubbed his hand over Naruto's spiked hair and gave him a little shove. Go on. The moment his kid had turned away, Kakashi closed his eyes and tried to keep calm. It would do no good to go into a homicidal rage here and start searching for Kyumo Nin to slaughter. He would scare the genin. After a moment of breathing exercises and imagining the soothing sound of an ocean, Kakashi felt in control enough to tuck the Hitaite into his pocket, open his eyes, and direct his genin subtly towards a more defendable spot while still seeming unconcerned. No need to do anything rash. There was nothing quite as risky as walking into an enemy stronghold with the intention to rig explosive devices in broad daylight. But, of course, that was what this squad was doing. They strode into Konoha like civilians with false passports, hesitated at stalls and shops, mingled with crowds, and eventually regrouped beside a children's playground. Let's get this done, muttered one, shifting his backpack to his other shoulder. We're on a tight schedule. They were. This was one half of a two-team double attack on Kanoha designed to make an impact on the tree huggers. Two families in Kanoha were a particular bane to Kumo. They were there to deal with the Hyuga clan, the other squad would handle the Hataki family. Privately, each member of the Hyuga squad believed that they had gotten the better end of the deal. Of course, that didn't make it any easier to avoid denizens and patrols and rig an entire, 52 building complex to explode at a certain time later that night. The job itself took ten nerve-wracking minutes, which was a short time to wait for a roast dinner but was an age when it came to rigging anything deadly. Everything went splendidly, and they were creeping out of the complex right on schedule. Of course, because nothing was ever perfect, trouble found them almost too late. A shinobi clad in the white armor of a Kanahan ANBU appeared just as the foreign squad dropped over the hive's walls. All froze. The ANBU recovered first. Hey! he shouted. One of the invaders glanced at another. No patrols are supposed to run past here. He hissed. You promised us that. Argue later, another said tersely. We outnumber him, grumbled a fourth. Unit backup arrives. Get out of here. The conversation flicked by in an instant, just long enough for the ANBU to pull out his katana and level it at the trespassers, obviously prepared for a battle. The intruders didn't wait to see what he'd do, taking off as fast as possible. The Enbu shouted after them, but they were gone. Almost. A single shinobi from the foreign group felt the ground give underneath him, sinking into it. An earth jutsu, he thought in disbelief. He actually caught me with an earth jutsu. It was enough catch and hold his foot to trip him, and he tumbled to the ground. The rest of the squad kept going, uncaring of their teammates' capture. He had one last glimpse of his squad, disappearing without a backwards glance, before the Conahan hit him with the hilt of the katana, and everything went black. When he woke, he was strapped to a chair in a dark room. It must have been purposefully designed to be dark, because he couldn't have been out for longer than a few minutes with a knock to the head like that. Somewhere outside, it was still only early afternoon, he was sure of it. That didn't help him out of his current predicament. So, a Kumo ninja, huh? The prisoner jerked at the sound, looking around to find that he wasn't alone. A masked Anbu was standing in the corner, examining the Hitai they'd found in his pocket. The prisoner glared, but somehow looked a little relieved all at the same time. The Anbu logged away the tiny detail and continued talking. Feel like telling me what you were doing outside the Hyuga complex? He said. I mean, that didn't end well for you guys last time and then the last time you came to our village. He let out a low whistle. Broken does not do justice to those corpses. The ANBU paused for effect. Sure, his hostage looked scared, but didn't look in a talkative mood. There was no response at all, not even a death to Kanoha. Nothing. All right, the masked man said. The foreign shinobi watched as he made a show of unwrapping several wicked-looking instruments. As I'm sure you know, Pain is never a very reliable method of interrogation. If I keep at you long enough with this he brandished a set of pliers designed to pull fingernails out, I bet I could get you to tell me all about how you spend last night being intimate with a giraffe while singing nursery rhymes about the moon. Still, we're on a limited time frame, so we really don't have much choice. The ANBU somehow managed to give the impression of a smile even through his mask, and selected his first instrument, 
an old-fashioned razor blade. Okay, he said. You probably don't care what my name is, but you can call me Tree Frog. All my friends do. You got a name? The prisoner didn't reply, just clenched his jaw. His interrogator sighed. So it begins, he said. Kakashi stood outside the orchard's big barn, watching his genin ferry in the last of the fruit they had picked that morning. They would spend the rest of the day sorting it out, and packaging it away before heading back out to the trees tomorrow. He was fingering the hitai Naruto had found, turning it over in his hands as he turned it over in his head. Why was it here? The most obvious reason was, of course, that a shinobi from Kumo had lost it at some point in the not-too-distant past. That didn't make sense, though. Between Hayashi and Kakashi, any Kumo ninja inside Fire Country, illegally or not, would be on high alert. Cautious to the extreme. Dropping something like a Hitaite spoke of incomprehensible sloppiness in face of such danger. And Kumo was much more rigid in their discipline than Kanoha, so it was doubled unlikely. Unless it had been left as a message? In just the right spot for Naruto to find it? But how would they engineer that? And anyone who'd done their homework would know that Naruto would turn straight around and hand it to his father. A message for Kakashi? It worked pretty well as a we were here, but it wasn't a very smart move to broadcast that fact. It might as well be a note saying Kumo Nin are in the neighborhood. Kakashi, please hunt us down and kill us horribly. Kumo Nin with suicidal impulses? Kakashi mused, watching the kids retreat into the airy barn to start sorting. Or a disproportionate amount of youth and arrogance per capita in this particular squad? Before he could contemplate it further, his senses warned him of a newcomer, and he spun around, a kanai materializing in his hand. Semi-false alarm. It was a man in ANBU gear, Kanoha's ANBU. He jumped down from the nearest apple tree and stalked closer, seemingly unconcerned by the weapon Kakashi was pointing at him. There was a kind of stiffness in his movements, though. That told the Jounin he wasn't here on a social call. Senpai, he spoke. Although Kakashi had recognized the man when he first appeared, the tone and choice of words were what convinced him to put the kanai down. He slid it back into its appropriate place in his pouch, and made a show of blinking in exaggerated surprise. Hello? The ANBU sighed and reached up to pull off his mask. A young man's smooth face was revealed bordered by a peculiar hitai that Kakashi knew was purposefully the same style as the Nighting Hokage's. Senpai, he said again. I need to talk to you. Kakashi glanced at the Kumo band in his hand. I'm a little busy, Tenzu. Can you talk while I do a perimeter sweep? The younger man nodded instantly. Uh Aha, sure, I can do that. He fell in step, seeming not to notice how paranoid Kakashi was in checking there was no one within a two-mile radius of them. Perhaps he was just used to the inherently more obsessive ANBU protocols rather than the D-rank with Gen in standard. Kakashi began to plod on his OCD round, moving a little more slowly than he normally would to give his friend some time to talk. He counted 18 steps before the ANBU began to speak. I did an interrogation today, he said. Tenzin knew he had to be careful now. If he started with Kumo Hitaite, he'd have a new, bigger problem in the form of Kakashi on a warpath. If he started with I hit him until he said something, he might be dismissed out of hand. Kakashi looked at him expectantly even as he kicked at a bush. The rabbit hiding there shot out, and Kakashi watched it go. Not an enemy ninja, not a henge. Just frightened wildlife. Tenza hesitated again. Aye, he was picked up just outside the Hyuga compound, he said. I'll found him. He says he's here to start a war. Was planning on going after the clan. Kakashi hummed, now inspecting an innocent birch. He just told you this? Just like that? Tenzu rolled his eyes. He didn't just tell me, he said. I encouraged him a little. Duh. Does it really matter? Point is, I got the information. So, he had a whole squad that got away, and he said there was another team somewhere outside the village wall. I thought you could help. So let me be sure I understand you, Kakashi said stopping and pulling Tenzu to face him directly. You discovered a threat to the village, to the Hyuga clan, over the course of an interrogation. And you didn't go to the Hokage, the council, or even your own CEO? Instead, your first thought was I gotta get Kakashi-senpai? 
Tenza blushed soundly, looking away. Shut up, he said, scuffing the ground with his sandal. I did tell my superiors, and I filled out the paperwork, but I just thought, it's going to take so long to go through the official channels, even if they do believe it wasn't just the captive blowing hot air. Skip to the part where you came to me, Kakashi ordered. Tenzi shrugged. Last time this happened, you dealt with it. Kakashi frowned. Last time this happened, he repeated, it was my own kid taken. I lost my temper and destroyed all chance we had of tracking the abductors back to their home. Besides, that wasn't even the last time this happened. Remember the prisoner a couple of years ago? The one they let bear at? He was here to kill, maim and destroy too. This is bigger than a stolen kid, Tenzu replied, impatient and completely ignoring Kakashi's other point. I think they're planning to kill them. Wipe them out, you know. Like the Uchiha. The notion was an unpleasant one. Still, Kakashi's response was to shake his head and groan. You know, I actually have my very own set of problems here. Naruto found this today. He offered the headband, and Tenzu took it, blinking at the symbol. That is a problem, he agreed. Kakashi was about to grunt and take the band back, but his friend kept talking. This is not a Kumo Hittite. Kakashi froze halfway through examining a tree for enemy Nin. What? Tenzu nodded. Yeah. Kumo's symbol has a kind of rounded edges rectangle bubble by itself, and just next to that two rounded rectangle bubbles connected together. They represent clouds. But this one, see? All three of the rectangle bubble things are discrete. It's been forged. Kakashi took the band and examined it closely. Tenzu was right. This missed the tiny link between two of the engraved bubbles. It was a sloppy mistake to make, but not one that caught the eye. How did you notice this? He asked. Tenza grinned. My prisoner had one on him. Apparently, he was going to plant it. Kakashi's eye widened a fraction. Someone is waging a psych war against me, he realized. I or the kids are the second target. The urge to throw the Hitaite away in anger was strong, but he bit it back and tucked it into his vest. Damn it. I'd almost prefer it to actually be Kumo again. Better the devil you know, Tenzu agreed. What do you think they're after? Kakashi shrugged. Until I know who they are, there's no way to tell. Could be an old enemy, new enemy, hired mercenary. Hell, it could even be Kanoha testing my sanity, or someone who wanted. He trailed off, and Tenzu tilted his head to look at him. Senpai? Are you alright? In the short term, it could be to separate me from the kids, Kakashi said. The first thing I did was do a perimeter sweep, and I even took you along with me. I left the kids all alone. I've got Naruto and an Uchiha on my squad. Do you know what their net value would be on the black market? Tenza paled as he calculated that, the price of the last Uchiha and the Hataki heir, each healthy, old enough to breed and young enough to control. The rough figure he came up with was enough to be a powerful motivator for either an individual or a village as a whole. Throw in a Hugo or two and... Maybe we should go back, he suggested, only to find that he was now talking to the shrub next to him. Kakashi had already taken off back to where he had left the kids. Tenza made to follow and promptly tripped when the bush took offense to being abandoned and curled a thin branch around his ankle. Oh, come on, he growled at it. Stupid thing. It took a moment to concentrate his Makatan ability again and force the plant to release him. He must have let his control slip while he worried about Kakashi's boys. That, or he was losing his ability to manage his inheritance. A glance around reminded him that he was, in fact, completely surrounded by foliage. He shivered. Better catch up with Senpai before I'm molested by apple trees, he thought, deciding to stick to the ground instead of taking to the canopy. It was safer. The six-man team hidden barely six miles from where Tenza had insulted a non-sentient being were tense. None wore any kinds of identifying marks, but each had at least one Hittite with a Kumo symbol hidden somewhere in their clothing. All would be acutely annoyed if they had heard the assessment of the one they had already planted, that there had been an error in the carefully forged items. It was a motley group. Three, two men and a truly terrifying woman, were built like boulders and had the temperaments to match. The other three, 
two grown men and a teenager, wore sour expressions and had the kind of washed-out, flat hair of people who lived in a place of constant rain. It was an unlikely union, but orders were orders. The captain, one of the rain non-adults, shifted to change the pressure on his tingling behind. They'd been sitting there for hours, all a little too spooked by the idea of Hotaki freaking Kakashi to risk moving around. As if his slight squirm had been a signal, all the others started shifting. Predictably, complaints soon followed. How much longer is this going to take? Asked one of the burly men. The captain didn't reply. Honestly, he was enjoying the stakeout. He'd finally dried off, for one. After all, he loved his hometown, would die for aim, if he had to. But the curse rain every day of the year made drying off nearly impossible. Most stores back home had caution. Wet floor signs either hung on their walls or bolted to their floors permanently, and problems like mold and leaking roofs were rampant. Then the captain swatted the fifth bug of the hour and dryly supposed that all places had their problems. I vote we go get him now, the woman muttered. Her own village mate scowled at her. Do you have rocks for brains? He demanded. It's a distinct possibility, the teen snickered. The kunoichi's face darkened, and a second later the teen recoiled with a muted howl of pain. The captain sighed and reached to pull out the samban now sticking out of his cheek. Play nice, he said to the woman, who took her weapon back with an eye roll. We stick to the plan. We take them at dusk. Yeah, spoke up the thus far silent iw We have to time it to match the other team, otherwise all of Kanoha will be on our arses. Oh, but it'd be easy, scoffed the woman. We'll wait till he's on his own picking fruit again, duck in, kill him, arrange him so it looks like he's fallen asleep and leg it out of there. We'd be home for breakfast. The captain rubbed his temple. We stick to the plan, he repeated. Now the teen was frowning. Wait, no one said anything about killing the kid, he said. The adult aim who wasn't the captain grunted. Our goal is to start a war between Kumo and Kanoha he said in the same tone used to explain that one plus one equaled two. Murder will do the same as abduction on that front, and it's less expensive and easier. Not if the kid we're trying to kill is guarded by a demon from hell, the kunoichi muttered. Noticing her teammates staring at her, she instantly turned defensive. What? You really think Hataki is human? That man has killed more than you or I could dream. Even when he was a kid. In the war, they called the Yellow Flash the devil. Well, Hataki was the demon who followed him around. A name Shinobi scoffed. Oh, please. Keep your IWA superstitions out of this. He's just a man. A man with a kill list a mile long, muttered one of the Kunoichi's village mates. Then, after a pause he added, seriously, I've seen it. It's really long. Ugh, you're all a bunch of wimps. I've seen more spine in caterpillars. We just have to kill one kid, who's protected by one man. It's not that hard, right, Captain? The captain just sighed, nursing his head in his hands. I wish I went with the other group. Blowing up a clan complex in the heart of an enemy village would be so much easier than dealing with all of you. It was a relief, if not a surprise, to find the genin safe and sound. In fact, they were even coexisting peacefully for once. Kakashi looked around the barn where they were sorting apples, unwilling to miss any threats and checking on each of his team individually. All three were fine, busy searching for rotten apples in the piles they had picked and packing the ones they had deemed worthy into big barrels for transport. Hi, Dad, Naruto greeted, halfway through emptying one of the collection buckets onto the floor so he could examine its contents. Kakashi reached for him and traced his face with one hand, reassuring himself that the boy was fine. Blue eyes blinked at him. You okay, Dad? Yeah, I'm fine, Kakashi said, looking around again. If the purpose of the Kumo Hataid had been to make him nervous, it was doing its job. The knowledge that it was planted by someone not from Kumo was actually just adding to his anxiety rather than assuaging it. He nearly responded with violence when Tenzu appeared at his shoulder, for some reason covered in leaves. Don't ask, Senpai, he said before Kakashi could say anything. Just know that I hate apple trees, and the vine outside got my mask. Yes, he was missing his porcelain mask. Kakashi decided not to comment at all. Instead, he looked back at his kid, 
who was watching the exchange curiously. Naruto, you remember Tenzin-san, right? Naruto screwed up his face, trying to place the name, or face, of the man. Uh, I think so. Didn't you once show me some of the things you ANBU guys used to hurt people? That night dad left me in ANBU HQ? No. Tenzi yelped, his voice rising to an embarrassing squeak as he panicked a little at the thought of being blamed for that. I didn't. I swear, it wasn't me, he added, looking at Kakashi. Thankfully, the father appeared to believe him. Well, he's come to help us with the harvest, he said, looking amused. Now Tenzu had a new reason to panic. Senpai. He squeaked in protest. Kakashi glared. Yes, Tenzu? Didn't you come out here just to find me? The implication was clear. He was staying and helping his superior contain the situation or else. And Kakashi senpais or else's tended to be a little more severe than a prank or a write-up. Tenzu was pretty sure his shoulders drooped as he realized defeat. Yes, sir. Kakashi smiled. Good, he said, turning back to the kids. I want you guys to stay inside, all right? You've all had enough sun for today. Tenzu and I are gonna go get your food. It's way past midday and you're all overdue a feed. You three just stay in this barn. Bye. And he was gone, pushing him mildly, though not verbally, protesting A and B U ahead of him. The genin watched him go, each silent and frozen in whatever motion they'd been halfway through before Tenzu came in. For a moment, the only sound was the mice rustling the hay. Then Sasuke spun and grabbed Naruto's collar. Speak, brat. Why is Sensei acting so weird? Why are we suddenly corralled in this barn and have two babysitters? Naruto squirmed, trying to pry Sasuke's strong fingers off his jacket. I don't know. He snapped. Leave me alone. He's your father. You know better than anyone, Sasuke countered, refusing to let go. Naruto gave up trying to force him away and instead slipped easily out of his jacket, leaving it dangling in the Uchiha's grip. I found a Kumo Hitaite on the ground today. It looked like it had been there forever, but Dad's really paranoid. He's probably just worried that the owner is still around. Sakura put her bucket of apples down and decided to join the conversation. Why? She asked, moving to the faucet to wash her hands off. I mean, why does he care so much? It's not like we're at war with Kumo. There was silence in the barn. Sasuke carefully didn't look at Naruto, or at Sakura, all his aggression leaking away. He crouched back down and returned to sorting his apple pile, tossing Naruto's jacket aside to do so. Of course he had heard about what had happened to Naruto, and Hyuga Hinata. His father had been very careful to tell him all about it, to warn him about strangers from other villages who might come for him. He just hadn't actually made the connection to this Naruto until Sakura had asked that question, somehow hadn't realized that this Naruto and the Hinata he knew were the ones in his father's favorite ghost story. Naruto struggled with an answer. He really didn't like reliving that episode in his life, and Sakura was at her core a civilian. She'd likely have a bad reaction. On the other hand, she was really annoying if you didn't give her the information she felt she was entitled to. And it wasn't like it was a secret. When I was a kid, I was abducted by Kumo Ninja, he said, choosing the blunt approach. My mom was from Kumo, so they figure they have a claim to me. Sakura gasped, green eyes going wide until they were near perfect circles. Naruto prepared himself for questions about the abduction, his rescue, the shinobi, what his dad was doing about it now. He was still surprised. Sensei had an affair with someone outside our village. The girl all but shrieked. Naruto blinked then cringed. I didn't expect her to care about mixed heritage, he thought uncomfortably. Surprisingly, Sasuke spoke up. It happens. Don't bother the brat over it, Sakura. Sakura looked surprised. No, she said, pushing apples out of the way so she could sit on the floor and hug her legs. It's so romantic. Love across borders, ah. She squealed into her knees, looking very much like she wanted to cuddle up to something and coo. Naruto shifted back a little, trying to get out of range. Uh, I don't know if it was. Naruto. Naruto glanced at Sasuke, surprised to be interrupted, 
and doubly surprised that Sasuke had used his name to do so. The Uchiha shook his head. Don't bother correcting her, he said, jerking his head at where Sakura was now gazing dreamily at the ceiling. She'll be far happier with the forbidden love story than any mission baby idiom you've come up with. Naruto still hesitated, but a glance at Sakura convinced him that Sasuke was probably right. Why ruin Sakura's happy little daydream? Bet I can sort my pile faster than you can sort yours, he challenged. Sasuke's eyebrow rose a fraction. You're on, brat. The rakage was cordoned in his office, barricaded against the rest of the village while he considered the guest he had cooling off in a secure holding cell. A runner from IWA had come knocking at his door. IWA was not a welcome symbol to see in Kumo ever since the Third Great Shinobi War, when Kanoha soundly trounced IWA, Suna and Kumo, the three defeated countries had retreated into their own borders and had been avoiding each other's eyes ever since. All three had wanted to lick their wounds and recover enough to regain the ground lost against the Kanahan superpower, but that would be impossible if the tree hungers noticed them cozying up together and decided to nip a new rebellion in the bud. When the runner had appeared with a IWA Hatayate and a note from his Kage, he had immediately been grabbed, stripped, searched, and thrown into a dark cube and the rakage was left wondering what to do. You was such a kid had promised him the Hataki boy. For nothing. A gift, to rebuild their two countries' friendship. Whatever that meant. To say the rakage was suspicious was an understatement, but he couldn't quite spot the catch. This couldn't be a convoluted plot to catch him out and give Kanoha a chance to seek vengeance for the dead Hyuga IWA hated Kanoha and wouldn't work with them even if Kanoha was crushing their stony little heads together. Above all else, IWA held grudges, and had a lot of bones with Kumo. So why the sudden charity? After another long moment, the Yandame summoned his aid and told her his decision. They would reserve judgment, until such a time as promises were fulfilled. And if they weren't, well, the rakage was a firm believer in the shoot-the-messenger philosophy. Some stamped up to the gates that marked the entrance to the Hyuga compound, feeling more than a little silly. Still, better safe than sorry. I'm here to see Hayashi, she said to the man at the gate, and he let her in without argument. Hayashi was sitting on his porch, gazing up at the late afternoon sky. Some, suddenly feeling very bulky and ungraceful in this serene setting, clomped over and thudded down beside him. The Hyuga looked a little surprised to see her. Some san. I was just thinking about you, he said. He paused, then chuckled, some thought amusing him. I suppose it's too much to hope that you are here to give me parenting advice? Not today, Sim said, noticing a tray with two full cups of stone-cold tea sat nearby, a third three-quarters full balanced on the railing, and a fourth mostly empty and clutched in Hayashi's hands. This visit's more practical. I'm here to save your life. The man smiled a little obviously expecting some story of a prank or jilted villager, or failing that the words this is an intervention for whatever reason. Some decided to be blunt. There's a prisoner that ANBU has, says he said explosives. The idea was to wipe your whole clan out, like the Uchiha. Hayashi had frozen. He said he had done this? Some nodded. Uh-huh. Said to go off at dusk. Might be a false alarm, but dusk is in like, twenty minutes. Might want to get everyone out just in case. The Hyuga considered. How did you come by this information? He asked. Some tossed her head, wild hair spilling everywhere. Enoichi was briefed. He's gonna interrogate tomorrow, but he kinda thought he should do something now, just in case. And he told you? Sim was getting twitchy at the inactivity and the fact that she was sitting in what might be a giant bomb set to go off any time. And I'm telling you. She snarled. What you gonna do about it? You can either ignore the threat, which is what the council did, and risk your life and the lives of everyone in this compound, or you can evacuate. And go where? Hi, she asked. Some groaned. You're a problem person, not a solution person, she accused, glaring. Me and the Inoshikacho clans will all take about a quarter of you. That way, you're split up in case this guy's teammates didn't split and make another attempt. The news that she had arranged safe places for them to stay seemed to convince Hayashi that Sim was sincere. He stood quickly and moved to the door. 
Hatame, he said to the girl in the next room, I need you to sound an evacuation. Now. Hurry. The girl, a branch member in charge of the clan head's housework, gave him a wide-eyed look of fear and took off running. Hi as she turned back to Tsum. Shall we help spread the word? Best idea you've had all day, Tsum said, and together they left the room. It was thirty minutes and a sunset later that they'd managed to get the entire clan out of the compound and quartered. Many Hyuga, high as she included, were looking suspiciously at the Inazuka clan members who'd turned up to help guide them to the other clan's homes. No explosions as the minutes ticked by and soon the clan began grumbling. Finally, Hayashi turned to Tsum with a significantly raised eyebrow. Tsum shrugged. Well, better safe than sorry, she said. Guess he was just making stuff up. I still reckon you should keep your people out of there for tonight, and have a bomb expert look through the place carefully in the morn. She was cut off by, as predicted, an explosion. Just a little one to start with, but it started a chain reaction until four or five large blasts had been detonated. Several buildings collapsed outright, and a fire flared into life. Shouts of alarm and fear echoed down the street. Sim, who had been knocked into Hayashi's arms by the shockwave, forced herself back upright and turned to look at the damage. She blinked at it for a moment. Ha! she said, turning back to Hayashi in triumph. You thought I was crazy, didn't ya? Well, are you glad you listened to me now? Hayashi seemed too shocked to properly reply staring at his home crumbling and gradually being engulfed in flame. How had this happened? How had enemies managed to get into his compound and do this unchecked? Had he really been so arrogant, so secure in his own superiority, that he had allowed this to happen? Father! The voice of the scared little girl reached him where nothing else could, and he turned towards it in a daze. F. Father! Hinata was pale as a ghost shaking uncontrollably as she pushed through the crowd to get to him. Go with your cousins, Hinata, Hayashi said instantly, already turning away as he presumed she was just scared by what had happened. His daughter's next words made him freeze, however. Father, I can't find Niji Nizen. Niji. For a horrible moment, Hayashi couldn't remember when he'd last seen the boy. Had he even been in the compound today? Then, the argument he'd had with the boy came flooding back, and he realized that the last anybody had seen, Niji had been locked in the clan head's home dojo. Would anybody have thought to check there, to get him? The answer came, horrible and insistent. No. Sim turned to say something to the Hyuga clan head just in time to see Hayashi's face slacken in a way that denoted pure horror. A second later, he had turned on his heel and was racing as fast as he could back into the complex. Hayashi. Some shouted then growled as she was ignored. Ah, damn it. Hannah, get these people hidden away in the other compounds. Now. Hannah nodded even as her mum dashed away. Father. Hinata screamed after Hayashi, then her eyes rolled back and she fell to the ground in a faint. Hannah reached to catch her a second too late, and the girl slipped through her fingers and hit the ground. Hey. Girl? Um, Hyuga-san? she said to an adult, trying to pull the unconscious girl to her feet. Please take her, she said. The Hugan nodded and picked Hinata up, walking back to join her designated quarter of the clan. Okay, Hannah called. We don't know if this is the end of it. Please, everyone, head to your hosts. Now. Everyone who's gonna hide out at the Inazuka place, follow me. She led the way back to her home, hoping that she wasn't abandoning her mother to death. She had a job to do. She had to get the Hyuga clan hidden safely in the other clan compounds, away from the people who wanted them dead. Then she could come back and look for her mom. Inside the Hyuga compound, Sim fought her way through the smoke, straining her eyes for any sign of Hayashi. Even the last few minutes had made a huge difference to the fire. It was as if it had grown into an inferno the moment people had entered, and there was no guarantee that the explosions had stopped or that the roof wouldn't fall in on them. The Hyuga was only a few meters ahead of her, also slowed down by the fire. But unlike Tsum, he didn't seem daunted by it. Niji! Hayashi's voice was difficult to listen to. It was filled with a particular brand of grief, a special type of guilt, and the kind of desperation only a father was capable of. Niji, where are you? Hayashi, 
We have to get out of here. Some shouted, loud enough to be heard over the roar of flames and crash of buildings collapsing. I have to find him. We can't breathe in here. Hayashi hesitated for a second, which was enough for Tsum to catch up. She punched him soundly on the shoulder in punishment for running into a flaming, possibly collapsing building. The Hyuga didn't seem to notice, scrabbling at his clothing. He pulled on the thick cloth until it tore and handed a sizable piece to Tsum. A second, he held up over his mouth as a defense against the smoke. Tsum quickly mimicked him, and breathing became a little easier. I will not leave the child here. Hayashi was saying, voice a little muffled by the muslin but still understandable. I have to find him. Tsum nodded, understanding an agreement in equal measures. We have to hurry, she said, internally tallying the odds that the kid was even still alive. They dipped lower every second, so time was of the essence. Where would he be? I sent him to a dojo in the east wing. He was to stay there and practice. He, he must still be there. He has to be. Sim just nodded and curled her fist around a bit of his sleeve. Can't get separated, she said. Hi, she nodded, then turned and plowed his way through the smoke. It took too long to find the dojo. They'd had to try three different ways before they found an uncollapsed passage that was not teeming with fire. When they got there, Hayashi threw himself at the door. The lock was a lost cause, as was the handle. Both would have heated to the point that touching them was impossible. Instead, some lent her strength and a kanai from her pouch, and between them they managed to tear away a few wooden panes, enough to slide into the room. The kid was crumpled on the floor of the dojo, still clutching his kanai. He was so close to the door that Hayashi actually stood on him when he darted through the DIY hole. Obviously, Niji had tried to escape when smoke poured in, but had been overcome before he could unlock or break down the door. Tsum, eyes streaming, continued her assault on the door. They'd never be able to drag the unconscious boy out the little hole they'd squeezed him through. She was still unclear how high she had fit, so she tore at the wooden panels with increasing desperation. It was getting hard to breathe. No wonder the kid passed out, she thought, ducking as low as she could to try and find some oxygen. Hayashi scooped up his nephew, slinging him over his shoulder and rushing back to Tsum. By now, she'd managed to widen their escape route by more or less tearing the door off its hinges, and Hayashi pushed her through. Gotta get out, she panted, still holding that scrap of his clothing over her mouth. Hayashi had been forced to drop his when he picked up Niji, so he coughed and nodded, fighting the instinctive urge to gasp. There was no air in here, he had to breathe shallowly or he might pass out too. Some led the way this time, her animal senses letting her avoid the worst of the fires. Hayashi followed, trying not to lose sight of her dirty vest or wild mane. They were unable to get out the way they'd come in. The fire had spread so that their path was blocked. Some paused to swear, and ducked into a sunroom. Hayashi knew it was a dead end, but couldn't seem to get enough air into his lungs to speak. The smoke was almost too thick to see through. Some shouted, and he thought maybe she'd been hurt. But it was just anger, frustration at finding no exit. Window, he said, and she made a noise of understanding. A second later, one of the antique redwood chairs went sailing through the air, shattering the glass pane keeping them penned inside. Smoke rushed out, air rushed in, and suddenly the fire lapping at their heels roared higher. Some rushed back to Hayashi, grabbing his arm. Gotta leave now, she panted, eyes wild. Hayashi nodded and shouldered her towards the window. She used the cloth she'd been breathing through to protect her hand as she cleared out remaining glass shards still clinging to the window frame and hopped out onto the tulips hanabi like so much. Turning back, she held out her arms and Hayashi passed Niji out to her, carefully holding him clear of the broken glass. Then he clambered out himself, took the boy back, and pushed some to make her start moving away from the fire. The air was still smoky, but clearer out here. That didn't change the fact that they were stuck in a burning compound, so they hurried to the boundary wall. A chakra-fueled hop later, they were out. They dragged themselves away from the compound. When they were far enough to be out of danger, Hayashi's knees gave out, and he fell to the ground, still clutching his nephew's limp form. Niji, he said, turning the boy until he was cradled like a small child. Niji, wake up. Please, please be okay. Niji. 
Sim was bent double, hands on knees as she took great gulps of fresh air and coughed out smoke. Somehow, she knew the taste of soot wouldn't leave her for days. She wasn't hurt, though, and eventually she straightened and turned to look back at the Hugo complex. It was completely engulfed. Hazy figures armed with buckets and soot and jutsu were trying to get close, but it was hopeless. The whole thing would burn to the ground. With no one in it, she reminded herself. The most important things that had been within those walls had been saved. Still, the Hugas had lost everything, home, heirlooms, wealth. This would be a blow to them. Something glinted on the grass near her, highlighted by the fire. A Hittite. Stumbling over, she bent and lifted it off the ground. Kumo. But she looked carefully, a forged symbol. She barked a laugh just as a frantic-looking Koromara bounded out of the darkness towards her. That's just bad taste, she said to him, showing him the headband. Her dog didn't seem to understand, too intent on checking that she was okay. Irritated, Tsum waved him away and turned back to Hayashi. The kid was still pale and limp, and his uncle was shaking all over. Tsum limped closer and sat down next to him, patting him on the shoulder. He'll be okay. We should get him to the hospital, though. Koromaru, go fetch a medic. Koromaru narrowed his one remaining eye, keeping himself between the burning complex and his master. Can I trust you not to do anything dumb? He rumbled. Tsum picked up a rock and threw it in her familiar's direction. Get going! Injured kid! Get us medical attention afore I skin you and make you into a throw rug. That was apparently enough to convince the dog that she wasn't planning on running back into the burning buildings again, and he stalked away. He'd be back relatively soon, probably with a terrified medic's hand chomped between his teeth, but that would do. Sim turned her attention back to her fellow clan head. Niji, he was still saying, again and again. Niji, wake up, please. The kid had a little more color in his face now, and he was still breathing, even if it was a horrible, rasping sound. He shifted a little, frowned, and finally, opened his eyes. You uncle? he said, and broke off into coughs that made some wince. Calm down, kid, she said, seeing the young teen begin to panic. You've been breathing in smoke. Damn near suffocated ya. We got a doc coming, you just keep on breathing. Your lung will hurt, but they'll fix you up soon. Niji nodded, taking a few gulps of air and managing to make the coughing peter off. He was looking around with wide eyes that made him seem younger than he was, pale irises shifting to Hayashi, the flames, some, the darkness behind them, and back to Hayashi. Of everything around him, it was obviously his uncle that was the most shocking sight. Hayashi's usually pristine muslin clothing was ruined, smeared with soot and torn. His usually ordered hair was in disarray and had curled horribly from the heat. Worse than all that, though, was the tears he was so nearly shedding, and the terror still stamped on every inch of his features. Um, Niji coughed twice, but wheezed out the last words, the only ones he could think to say, sorry, uncle. Hayashi put a hand on his cheek and pulled so that Niji ended up clutched to his uncle's chest. This was the closest he had ever been to his aloof relative, in his living memory, even when he was very young. Somewhere in the back of his mind, Niji registered that Hayashi smelled just like his father had, though his embrace was much more awkward. Sorry? Hayashi repeated, apparently incredulous. No, no. How can you say, no? I put you in that room, I made you stay there. I didn't come get you. I am so, so sorry, Niji. How could I? I almost lost you. When I found you. Niji's chest was twitching in little almost coughs, no doubt as a response to damage done by the smoke, but that didn't stop him from staring like his uncle had grown a second head. You came in to get me? He said. Somehow, he'd expected that his uncle had sent some branch member, or maybe that Inazuka-sama had gone in with her dog and gung-ho attitude, to learn that his uncle had risked his life for some lowly branch Hyuga. Of course I got you, Hai, she said. There was a bit of a commotion outside their immediate sphere of existence, and all of a sudden men were pulling the genin away, laying him flat on a stretcher to take him to the hospital. The movement made his coughing flare up again, and Niji barely registered Hayashi grasping his hand tightly. How could I ever face your father again, if I hadn't? 
he said, ignoring the medics trying to make him let go so they could help the boy. And I would have, too soon. How could I survive letting one of my children die? Niji had no reply to that. Hayashi was convinced that he never heard, given how distressed he was and the general chaos around him that was the medics trying to get him to breathe. But he had. And he didn't forget it. Every second seemed to wind him tighter. Kakashi could actually feel the tension, the pressure coiling in each muscle until it was ready to snap. He was sure the enemy was just as impatient as he was, but he had to wait just a little longer. Tenza believed they were ready. Still, their plan had an element of risk to it, risk that Kakashi wasn't sure he could bear. They had decided that the squad they suspected were preparing an assassination or abduction would wait until the trek home, when everyone was tired, relaxed and unprotected, at their most vulnerable. Kakashi and Tenza had come up with a way to catch them, but the first step involved Kakashi actually taking the kids out into the open as bait, and he didn't know if he was prepared to do that. Tenza sat cross-legged on the ground and watched the shadows thicken, waiting for Kakashi's nerve to harden or break. You know, he said, scraping boredom-induced patterns in the dirt, the longer we wait, the darker it'll get. The darker it'll get, the harder to get them and protect Naruto. He paused, then added the afterthought, and Sasuke, and Sakura. Kakashi nodded. Yeah. You're right. Let's do this. He considered. Are you sure you've got everything set up? Tenza nodded. Uh Uh-huh. You just make sure you take the path we agreed. Don't go too fast. Keep moving. I'll take care of everything else. Okay? I'm gonna go get into position. The older shinobi nodded, so Tenza turned to leave. He only got a step and a half before Kakashi had hold of his arm again and hissed a warning. He better not notice, Kakashi said, obviously meaning Naruto. I don't want a new batch of nightmares over this. He's only just stopped reliving his last abduction. Tenza turned away so Kakashi would not see his exasperated expression. He never knew Senpai could be so overzealously protective. I'm beginning to reevaluate my belief that parenting was good for him, he thought, mostly in jest. I got it, Senpai, he said aloud, twisted his arm away and vanished into the trees. As far as plans went, this one was inelegant. Kakashi nervously gathered his kids together and sent them down the decided path, keeping them close by engaging them all in conversation. Naruto was chatty as always, and the other two just seemed delighted to be included, and so were yammering away as well. Even the recalcitrant Sasuke added a few comments. None of them seemed to notice Kakashi's anxiety, or the way he looked for danger in every shadow. But there was danger, impossible to spot. Six of the shadows were not just twilight ghosts made by tree branches. One by one, each of those six detached themselves from their hiding spots and crept closer, and the noisy bunch of children reached their choke point. The captain didn't bother to look around as he fixed on the famous Hataki Kakashi. He knew the only other shinobi around were his own, anyway. They were all in place, waiting, waiting. The moment the first of the squad below set foot in the area they'd selected for ambush, he gave his signal and darted towards them as well. In and out, four to overwhelm and wound Hataki Sr., one to grab Junior and one to stab him. The other genin didn't have the training to react in time, and they'd be out of there before Hataki could recover enough to give chase. Well, that was the plan. But the captain had only gone two steps before the tree branch twisted up and around, catching him squarely in the gut and tossing him backwards. He was caught by a cradle of wood and promptly squashed by every other member of the squad. It was as if the forest had become sentient, picking up and tossing them together like tin soldiers. Hataki's groups marched on, oblivious, and the captain tried to squirm his way free, to salvage the situation. Only there didn't seem to be a way free. Everywhere he looked, it seemed like there was a mesh of branches, of living wood, and he realized that they had been trapped. When the cage stopped swinging, it was possible to make out a grinning face through the gloom. A body to match literally melted out of the tree until he was sitting on a branch, examining them in their ANBU armor-clad man reached up to tousle his own hair and grinned wider at their expressions. Haya. Caught you. Let us out. Shouted the kunoichi. Tenza's grin disappeared. Why? So you can murder Kakashi-senpai's son? Or blow up the Hyuga clan? 
maybe start a war between Kanoha and Kumo. The sight of their faces all paling made him grin again. You weren't as sneaky as you think, Ninjichan. Anyway, you guys sit tight. I'll be back. Assuming I can convince Kakashi Senpai not to kill you, you'll all be arrested, interrogated, and eventually traded back to your own villages. When you tell us what they are, of course. But look on the bright side. You're all way better off in my cage than on the end of Senpai's blade. With that parting word, he activated a jutsu that sealed the cage with vines, making it inescapable, and jumped down from the tree. If he hurried, he could get to HQ and get the prisoners relocated before Senpai came back looking for blood. Stopped an assassination, stopped a war, got Kakashi Senpai to owe me a favor, he thought. Not bad for a day's work. After the events of the last day, it was typical that the one out of place thing Naruto noticed was the Chunin manning the desk when they turned up to report. Not a mission report, but rather a written account of all that had happened that day, but the Genin didn't know that. They didn't even realize that as they hadn't completed their fruit picking mission yet, they couldn't be handing in a report. Daiko Kosensei, aren't you on a mission? The teacher looked disgruntled. No. We got an hour down the road before we were attacked by a puddle. Barely escaped with our lives, and then the client tells us that he's actually been targeted by a crime lord. Kakashi made an impressed noise. That was the sort of thing that usually happened to him, so he was inexplicably delighted that he had somehow skipped that little C2-ranked adventure. What did you do? Naruto asked. Daikoku shrugged. Kotetsu got scratched with a poisoned blade, so we brought him back here and stuck him in the hospital. What about the client? Asked Sakura. Will he still get escorted back to Wave? Daikoku's grin turned evil. Yeah, that's sorted too. After we all expressed our extreme displeasure, of course. How? Oh, I explained the concept of royalties to the old drunk. Huh. Well, his story checked out, see? He is actually building a bridge that will, when it's finished, generate a lot of income. So I explained to him that even though he can't afford the price of an A-ranked mission, he should approach the Hokage and make a deal. They nutted it out pretty quick. Kanoha will defend the entire bridge operation, builder and all, and in return get 15% of everything it makes his family in the next 10 years, as well as half the price of the toll they'll be putting on the bridge for the first year. It was a good deal, for both parties. Naruto scratched his head and screwed up his face as he tried to process. Wait, what? Sasuke made an impatient noise. Kanoha Ninja will protect him, but he'll pay for it later with the profits he makes rather than now with his own money. Get it, brat? Oh. Not really, but okay. Daiko could just smiled. As for me, I'm going back to the academy. Too much excitement on that one. I know exactly how you feel, Kakashi said, handing him the report. That's it for part 6. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.